what I do very often is I listen to the audio versions of books and audio histories. And, and one thing I've been doing is rereading slash listening the story of civilization. So that's the history of Western civilization by Will and Ariel Durant. And it's, it's, you know, a dozen volumes, a thousand pages each volume. It takes about 50 hours to get through each one. And, you know, it's our, our oriental heritage and the life of Greece and Caesar and Christ and the history of Rome and in the Middle Ages, the age of faith. You know, right now I'm listening to the age of Voltaire, you know, and I think it's really, really constructive uh, to do this for a couple of reasons. For, I mean, first of all, now you can, when I'm on a treadmill or walking down the street or in a car, I'm listening. So I, I, I feel like I accomplish more of my time than if I listen to the same uh, song on repeat 98 times, even though I enjoy the song, but it's like 98 <laughs> times the same song. Um, but the second thing is, when you, when you study the history of the world, whether it's the story of Western civilization or Murray Rothbard wrote some really detailed books on, um, on uh, the economic, um, economic circumstances in the United States before Revolutionary War, called Conceived in Liberty, or he wrote a, you know, an Austrian economist view on the history of economic thought. And so the history of economic thought for thousands of years. And when you listen to those things at the age of maturity, you understand better and differently than when you, first of all, I didn't read it, you know, in my teens or twenties. And now I, I do read certain things. But the second thing is, is if you've lived long enough, then when you read the stories again, you understand what happened and, and it makes a lot more sense. So, and it's very relevant to Bitcoin because what you see is, um, is you see the, the uh, tension between chaos and order and between authority, uh, th those, those wishing to impose authority and then those wishing uh, to promulgate freedom. And also, um, it helps you uh, to overcome a lot of a lot of tropes, a lot of cliches. You know, for example, uh, people have been creating money uh, or currencies for thousands and thousands of years. And in just about every single one of these stories, it always starts with a new ruler, a virtuous society, a new currency. They keep it strong. They expand. Everybody trades in the currency. Then uh, they expand some further, then they have to fight a war, then they print more money to fight the war, then they debase the currency. Pretty soon, uh, the currency isn't worth anything. People don't want to trade with them because they debased the currency, they inflated it away. And then at some point, the soldiers realize that the money they're being paid in is worthless or, or the soldiers don't get paid. And when the soldiers don't get paid, they all mutiny or they desert. And then invariably what happens then is someone outside of those borders wins the battle. And of course, that civilization uh, blames their decline on the barbarians. Like, it wasn't our fault. It was bad guys who speak a different language or have a different religion. They actually attacked us unprovoked. And, uh, and the story is always bad people cause the collapse of our civilization. But, but the real story generally is the civilization got fat, dumb, and happy, and then they got arrogant, and then they started counterfeiting money, and then they forgot that you can't pay your own soldiers with counterfeit money. And somewhere between the people starving to death or, or all the soldiers deserting, they found that they weren't able to continue with the wars they were fighting. And then they lose the war. And then the next society uh, rises, and then they do it all over again. And it happens. Uh, it's not a dozen times, it's not a hundred times. If you read this, it's thousands and thousands of times you see the rise and the decline and the fall and, and the reemergence. And there are always these common principles and the principles have to do with uh, power and energy, right? The societies that, uh, that don't know how to, you know, if you don't understand firepower, like the, the Japanese, they didn't really want to embrace guns, so they just passed a law, no guns. And then the Westerners showed up with guns. The same thing happened in China for a while, where they just didn't, they wanted to close their borders, and so they were against modern techniques, and then the Westerners show up with uh, firepower, and then, uh, and then the borders get open, and then, uh, and then the, the political uh, power structure collapses.
and then another, you know, at some point someone comes up with a better cannon and the people in denial lose the next battle and then somebody comes up with a better ship and then the people in denial have less sea power and so they get choked to death and then someone comes up with a, you know, a tank and then there's airplanes and, and it goes on like that. It's always about harnessing power, harnessing and channeling energy and you've got the physical energy and that's how people win the wars and then you have the economic energy and all the really good societies they manage to create trading networks on a solid a strong currency that people trust and then eventually the grandson of the person that set it up gets a bit cheaper and then the great grandkids get a bit cheaper they start fighting amongst each self them each other then they debase the currency then their armies you know their armies desert them and their trading partners don't want to trade with them and all of the commercial energy bypasses them and then they blame it on the barbarians and it starts anew so that's all in will durant if you read it and what you realize there's just nothing new under the sun everything's been played out and and history is almost the story of a bunch of uh arrogant alpha males that are a bit ignorant to think that this time it's different and they were put on earth to fix things and they go you know alexander the great goes gallivanting off you know in his late teenage years and of course we call him the great but the joke is after he basically you know conquered 200 countries and lost all of his army he died by age 33 and everything collapses within months after he's dead so <laughs> It's like you can do this stuff for a year, two years, ten years, and then everything collapses under its own weight, and and it goes on and on and on like that. So I, I really like listening uh, to that or reading those histories. I think you can learn a lot from them. And the most useful thing you can learn is this is not the first first time this has been done. In fact, it, it's it's common throughout human history every single civilization it failed because either it couldn't channel power it was less powerful technically from an engineering point of view right or because it couldn't channel capital like economic power and its and its monetary systems were were uh completely defective or they were inferior right the society that trades glass beads gets stomped on by the society that trades metal coins and the ones that trade gold coins stomp on the ones that trade copper coins and and then even then you believe that gold is money the Spaniards go off conquer the new world they bring back all the gold it doesn't solve the problem because they inflate the gold supply by a factor of five so they created hyperinflation their own economy collapsed and the Spanish Empire collapsed because they didn't understand uh, the implications of of inflating the money supply and uh, they figured that out the hard way 1700 years after the Romans figured it out and they figured it out 500 years after the Greeks figured it out and it happened in Egypt and it happened in Assyria and it happened in China and it's 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 happened as many times as we can write it down and it's probably yeah. happened a hundred thousand times that we didn't write down and so yeah I, I encourage people to read history <laughs> especially good uh, good political history, good economic history. <laughs> and uh, 1500, uh, in 1500, they were using paintings as a store of value in Italy, right? That's, that's an interesting thing that comes out, you know? Uh, you, you'll find all of these principles just keep popping up. How do you find scarce, desirable assets to store your value in a, in a portable fashion? And if you read it, then you'll say, wow, Bitcoin would have solved that problem. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's great. And I encourage people to read Durant and to read Rothbard and to read, you know, pretty much any history written by, a, you know, a reputable source. And do it now that you're an adult because you understand things now that you didn't understand when you were in school. And it will resonate differently with you. The idea that, uh, that BlackRock and Fidelity and Grayscale and Bitwise and ARK, they're all taking Bitcoin public at the same time is a big deal. Um, 
the fact that you know, I'm not surprised they're successful as ETFs because Bitcoin's the apex ETF. The other ETFs are based on oil, like let's say commodity ones, oil, gold, platinum, silver, market baskets of commodities, natural gas. All of these things are defective as investment assets because, com because physical commodities aren't scarce. Physical commodities can be manufactured in any amount with additional capital and know-how. So ultimately, um, the best of them is the gold ETF. But if, uh, if a bunch of money flows into a commodity ETF, that just actually fuels capital into commodity producers. They just dump that commodity on the market, the price gets held down. So commodity ETFs were never that great an idea. Um, on the other hand, comparing these, these Bitcoin ETFs to the S&P index, the biggest ETF and maybe the biggest development on Wall Street was the launch of the Spider SPY, in 1993, uh, about 30 years ago. And the idea that you could create an ETF that, that represented a market basket of 500 stocks, that was big, and especially that was big because that came along at a point where people had lost faith in, in the currency as money as a savings technology. And so they were trying to figure out what is money and actually an entire generation of people picked the S&P index as money, right? How, how are you going to store your, your excess cash for a decade or longer? Not a checking account, not a savings account, not a bond, uh, but the S&P. So the S&P became money and that ETF became the monetary index. And that's why today, Amongst, you know, that, that's the most successful ETF. If you look at SPY and all the S&P index type ETFs, they have most of the capital in them. But um, the problem with those ETFs is that, is that stocks also are not conservative. So if I increase the price of uh, the stock by a factor of 10, you're getting more equity. Or if, another way to say it is, if I take hundreds of billions of dollars of cash, and I buy the ETF, like S&P ETF. The ETF has to buy all 500 stocks pro rata, which means they're gonna to have to go buy Tesla and Apple and Google and Meta at any price. They're price insensitive, even if they're overpaying. So when they buy it at any price, what they're doing is they're creating more equity because they're encouraging those companies to issue more stock. And then of course, uh, this is common sense. If the price of your stock doubles, the employees in the company with stock options, they sell the stock, right? They sell the stock option. When they sell the stock option, you put more stock on the market. So the price, uh, the price creates supply. There's a price supply uh, elasticity there. And that's the same as you have with commodities. It's the same as you have with REITs, real estate investment trust. And it's the same thing with bond funds. When you have capital flows into all those other asset classes, you create supply of that asset. They're not scarce. Bitcoin's unique because no amount of capital flowing into a Bitcoin ETF is going to create any more Bitcoin. You know, what we've got is 900 Bitcoin a day. And around April 16th to April 18th of this year, we're going to go to 450 Bitcoin a day. This will be the halving, but it will be the single most consequential halving in the history of Bitcoin, because you're talking about, it's the equivalent of someone coming in the market saying, I'm going to buy eight and a half billion dollars of Bitcoin a year for the next four years, guaranteed. That's the demand impact, right? Eight and a half billion, $23 million a day at the current price. Now, that, that's a huge amount, but more importantly, that's a huge demand supply shift in the year when the demand via the ETFs has jumped by a factor of four to 10 times the daily supply. So what you have is institutional capital entering, and then you have the supply getting cut in half. And um, you know, what happened with these ETFs? Well, uh, here's what happened. The approval of the ETFs was, was a uh, pretty concrete endorsement of Bitcoin as an asset class by the regulators. 
And anybody that's thinking about banning Bitcoin or not approving Bitcoin ETFs, they're now out of consensus. So it really flipped the global consensus from, well, maybe it's too good to be true, maybe it'll be banned, maybe it won't be banned. Uh, the approval of those ETFs meant that it doesn't matter who wins the 24 elections. It's taken the future of Bitcoin out of the hands of the president. It's taken it out of the hands of the next head of the SEC. It's taken it out of the hands of, of most regulators in the world. It's, we pretty much opened Pandora's box across the Rubicon. It's very concrete at this point. And it was uncertain right before. And so that's a, that's a very big uh, piece of regulatory clarity. What happened next is it, it's created a positive dynamic where now I think you're seeing pressure to approve ETFs in other places in Asia. You'll probably see Hong Kong spot ETFs. You'll probably see them uh, come uh, get approved in any country where people are on the fence. It also created a fee war. It used to be that you paid two and a half percent, you know, to hold your money in grayscale. And all of a sudden now you're paying one and a half percent of grayscale, but you're paying 25 basis points at BlackRock, or you're paying 20 basis points and even 19 basis points. Not only that bring down fees for institutional holders of Bitcoin in the US, it also put pressure on international fees. Let me, let me convert the math here. If you have an infinite duration asset and you're going to put, uh, if you're going to put money in it, then the difference between 2% um, fees and uh, 25 basis point fee is losing 37% of your money. <laughs> you understand? Like, like, it's like I take a third of your money, okay? So if you're a Bitcoin investor, you know, having low fees means you invest a million and you get to keep the million. Having high fees mean you invest a million and you lose 300,000 of it over the course of 20 years. So those low fees are, well, where is that, where is that going to manifest itself? It's going to drive the price of the asset up. <laughs> First of all, because the people that own the asset aren't losing one or two percent of their money every year. But second, because there are a lot of people that they will either invest a million dollars in it or nothing, right? So if I like it, I'll just invest a million. If I don't like it, I'll invest nothing. So you start to see money flowing from gold into Bitcoin, from real estate into Bitcoin, from the S&P index into Bitcoin. And so that's a big deal. So, so the, the launch of the ETFs, it's been very successful. This is the ideal type of asset to put into an ETF wrapper. It's definitely the most, it's the global asset. It's the biggest brand. Everybody knows what it is. It's actually the best thermodynamically sound investment. It's got the best historic performance. And of course, it doesn't have the entire array of uh, risk factors that a company has or that a bond has. It doesn't have credit risk. It doesn't have corporate execution risk, you know, and it, and it doesn't have uh, currency devaluation risk. And it doesn't have the physical risks uh, of real estate. It's not going to ever get hit by a bolt of lightning. There's not going to be a tornado. It doesn't have maintenance decay. It doesn't have property tax risk. It doesn't have the political risk, right? Ask yourself the question, you got a billion dollars uh, and you got to buy some real estate in Africa. Where? In a, where do you want to invest a billion dollars in a building? What, what country? What city? <laughs> where? Or you can buy Bitcoin. And of course, so you can see this is a higher quality thing. Uh, what was Bitcoin's number one liability coming into 2024? It wasn't uh, the risk. It wasn't the thermodynamic risk factors. It wasn't the technical capabilities. The number one risk factor of Bitcoin coming into 2024 was a government would ban it. But see what just happened in January, the opposite. Right. So so most of the FUD around Bitcoin is, oh, yeah, it's too good to be true. And because it's too good to be true, the government's going to hate that you, you bought it and they're going to take it away from you. And uh, with the approval of these ETFs, it was the it was the government of the most powerful 
country in the world, the United States, which is actually the leader of financial regulation. I mean, whatever the U.S. does uh, will influence Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, all of the EU, even Hong Kong, even China, for that matter, and all of South America and all the African regulators. So everyone's looking to what happens in the United States. This was a very powerful signal. So that was a, that was a bullish development. There was a little bit of um, weakness following, you know, and, and I think that's fairly well understood uh, as a couple of factors. First of all, a lot of capital rebalancing. There was capital sitting in the futures, uh, Beto and other Bitcoin futures because institutional investors don't have crypto accounts. They can't trade uh, with most of the crypto exchanges, so they had to buy the futures. And the, the cost of rolling a Bitcoin position in the futures is like 10%. You know, like, I mean, imagine you have a million dollars and someone charges you $100,000 a year just to have the trade on, right? I mean, so you, you could see anybody with that position, they roll out of the futures and they're rolling into the spot. So there's a lot of that. There were some people rebalancing. They had positions in Bitcoin companies and the miners and micro strategy, et cetera. And they're rolling out of those trades or rebalancing or, or arbitraging. There's a lot of people trapped in grayscale and they couldn't get out. And then this unlock allowed some of them to redeem at par. And so there are some people that, that had, they had five years of pent up demand to redeem. And so we worked through that. And then you have the arbitraging between the, the high fee grayscale and the lower fee other, other uh, ETFs. And then finally, you have a lot of Bitcoin tied up in bankruptcy estates, in FTX, in Genesis, maybe, you know, it, it, you know BlockFi, Celsius, Voyager, Three Arrows, Genesis, FTX, Alameda. Well, all of those estates are controlled by lawyers. And the lawyers aren't long to, they're not hedge fund managers. They're not even 10 year investors, right? The lawyers have legal and process constraints. And maybe what they want to do is just wind down the trust, pay out the trustees to clear, or, or the creditors to clear a victory and move on, right? So I think there's a lot of selling pressure that came out of that because a lot of them were holding GBTC and they wanted to redeem the GBTC at par, right? And get liquid. And so I think there's, uh, these are the transients, but at the end of the day, they're just transient factors, right? If you're buying Bitcoin with a, with a, sh a short time horizon for responsible investors, four years. So if you're buying Bitcoin with a four year time horizon, this shouldn't matter to you at all. And of course, the right time horizon is 40 years. It's like your, your useful investment life maybe, and I mean, the inspired one is 400 years, right? If you think out 400 years, you'll do brilliant things, right? If you think out 40 years, you'll probably make the right decision. If you think out, you know, like uh, 10 to 20 years, you won't have anxiety. Four years is the minimum. But, you know, people that are trading with four weeks and four months, right? They're just going to make awful decisions. They're the ones that probably panic sold it when it traded to 39,000 or they panic sold it when it traded to 16,000 or 20,000, 12 to 16 months ago. And they probably bought it for the wrong reason. But ultimately, what we've seen is Bitcoin came public. It's clear that you're going to be able to own this as property for the long term. It's clear that this is going to catalyze a bunch of very positive behavior by other regulators in the world. It's going to accelerate institutional adoption. It's going to embolden the political supporters of Bitcoin. It's going to create a marketing war between various Wall Street firms. We see that going on right now. And, uh, and it's, it's going to strengthen and empower all of the OG Bitcoin holders because even right now, people talk about you know, what is BlackRock bought 6 billion of Bitcoin and all these new ETFs they bought, what have they bought? Like 1% of the supply. Well, that means 99% of the supply and 99% of the beneficiaries so far are the non ETF holders, right? I mean, there's hundred X as much, but if Bitcoin's up $10,000 a coin since this happened, well, that benefit accrued 99%. Right, that's a $200 billion improvement in the market cap of Bitcoin. 
And of the 200 billion, 99% of the 200 billion accrued to people who don't even own the ETF, right? So it's, it's accelerating, you know, institutional adoption and it's just accelerating Bitcoin adoption and empowering everybody else in the ecosystem to do all the things that they want to do. Apple was the digital transformation of devices and communications. And Facebook was a digital transformation of relationships. Uh, the idea that you could literally monetize someone's relationship with their friends, right? Uh, and, uh, and with Apple, you know, your tape recorder, you know, dematerialized into the phone and your camera dematerialized in your phone. And then all your photos dematerialized in the photo album. And then your CD collection dematerialized, you know. Uh, all these things, all your files dematerialize. So uh, I always thought of uh, technology like acid, it's just eating away and dematerializing things. Um, and um, Google just dematerialized every library in the world. And it, you know, and uh, YouTube, you know, dematerialized most video, but also you're looking at the dematerialization of education and entertainment, right? Education, entertainment, you know, information, very profound things. So what are the consequences of that? Well, the idea that you could create one generic device, the iPhone, that a billion people would want, and that you could update and improve over the weekend with the software push, that was a big idea, right? That was a, that's a massive uh, crystallization in the economy, whereby, it, what if I told you I could replace 27 billion different devices manufactured by a thousand different companies they come in 10,000 different form factors that are all analog, that are fixed, that can't be updated. And what if I said, we're gonna replace all of those companies and all those devices and all that functionality with a single device running one operating system, the iOS, controlled by one company. Well, that would make that company the most valuable company in the world. And that would make that company the most valuable company in the world because that company could create the most value. Because on the weekend, they could give everybody 40 million songs, right? Everybody has, you know, I'm giving everybody a uh, 100,000 album library and they can listen to any song anytime for the cost of electricity. And I don't have to manufacture uh, 10 billion records or 10 billion CDs. And I don't have to have 100,000 music stores, right? Like it used to be there were stores and they put CDs in them and trucks rolled, <laughs> right? We, met, we had factories to make them and we had trucks to deliver them and we ha had 100,000 people to sort them and stack them and we had stores and we paid for electricity and people went to the store, Tower Records, and <laughs> they picked it up. Well, the crystal crystallization in physics, it's it's where you're collapsing to a low energy state. You know, you're going from water vapor or steam to, to water to ice. And at each step, energy gets given off, right? And it's a basic thermodynamic idea, energy, heat. But, you know, in an economy, energy is money, right? Energy is profit. So when we collapse, when, when we stopped manufacturing film and cameras and recorders, you know, and, and, and phonograph records and CBDs and DVDs and, and, and whatever you manufacture, when we stop that, we reclaimed a huge amount of energy and that converted to money. And that accrued to the people uh, that, most of it accrued to the people that use the Apple product that's why they became the most famous brand, right? I mean, everybody knows it's kind of cool to have 500,000 photos on your iPhone, right? It's like, and they're all there. Uh, so it accrued to them, but a small portion of it accrued to Apple and that went to their shareholders and that made them the most valuable company in the world. So in 2010, 2011, I looked at it and I said, well, eventually everybody's gonna want this. Eventually everybody's gonna have a computer in their pocket and it's pretty clear, it's like a, it's kind of a winner take all thing. Apple, Apple ended up generating all the profit in the mobile phone industry and everybody else lost money to compete with them. So it wasn't like they had 20% market share and got 20% of the profit. It was like they had the best product. They had 150% of the profit 
150% of the profit, 20, 25% of the market, everybody else lost money to compete in the space. And, you know, where did they go? Remember what happened to BlackBerry, what happened to Nokia, etc. Eventually, they all just went away. Motorola, yeah, if you recall. So, the way you make money is when you see a digital trend, um, mo everybody needs it. Nobody can stop it. But nearly everybody disagrees with you. Right? It's like, if the majority of people disagree with you, they don't understand it, but nobody can stop it, but everybody needs it. That describes Amazon, right? You, if you go back and read investment research on Amazon, everybody hated it. You know what they said? They said, oh, this is an awful retail company. They don't make any money. Well, they kept not making any money while they sucked the entire market up. And now there's Amazon, Walmart, and everybody else is bankrupt, right? 20,000 retail companies fail. You know, one or two, Amazon, you know, Walmart, Target kind of are there, and then Amazon runs by everybody. It's because everybody, you know, who doesn't want to have everything they want delivered to their door in one hour for free? Who doesn't want that? Just like with Google, I want to go and I ask a question, I want to answer instantly, quick, and I want every book and every piece of information that the human race has at my fingertips instantly. Well, who doesn't want that? Everybody wants that. How about YouTube? Okay, well, like, it's everything you want to know for free instantly everywhere in the world. Okay, so everybody's eventually going to need it. Billions. You know, there's YouTube videos. They've got like billion, nine billion views, you know, on, on the video, right? So everybody wants it. Nobody can stop it. But then again, everybody thought it was a stupid idea, right? They, did, they didn't really get it. And the same was true with Apple. It's like people just didn't get it. And I'm like, well, a, a device that basically does everything you want it to do in your pocket that's, you know, a million times more powerful than the computer in the space shuttle. And uh, everybody said, well, it's too expensive. Remember they say, too, you, you know, um, you could buy Nokia phones for like $30. And the iPhone came out and it was $500. And the people made fun of it. It's, five, it's 10 times as expensive. Well, what happened next? Well, Apple raised the price to $750, and uh, the other phones were 20 bucks. and then Apple now sells iPhones for $1,500. <laughs> so Apple keeps raising the price of the iPhone, and all these other cheap phones went to zero because at the end of the day, the point was that it's what people want, right? It's just, it's just better. They don't want it. People used to think, oh, they just want the cheap thing just like they'd make fun of Amazon for this or that, but no, they don't. So those companies, they represent the digital transformation of retail, of information, of relationships. They made fun of Facebook, but you know, it's like when 4 billion people or 3 billion people are on a network, it's just so incredibly powerful that you can't stop the thing. These companies are now more powerful than a lot of countries, a lot of national governments, but the key point I'd make is the time to buy them was when everybody laughed at you. You know, back in 2010 to 2012, most people would have laughed at you. You know, with regard to Apple, you know, they would laugh. They would say, well, you know, it's too expensive and Nokia's got the market and, or Motorola or this or something. Or they'll never, you know, the, the, the telephone companies will control the business. Or they would say, well, the stock is too high, so you should sell the stock because here's a, here's a classic one. It was 5% of my portfolio, the stock doubled, now it's 10% of my portfolio, but my investor mandate is I never wanna have any stock more than 5% of my portfolio. So every time Apple doubles, you know, the giga brains sell, sell half their position. And so then it doubles again, so they sell half again. So then it doubles again, so they sell half again. So then it doubles again, so they sell half again. So after 10 years, they've got a little bit of Apple stock and they bought all of the computer companies that went bankrupt. And they did it in a risk adverse fashion. And, you know, again, the key point is diversification is selling the winner to buy the loser. 
And it's, it's this common Wall Street meme or cliche, and they probably teach you in business school, and a bunch of guys in suits, they will tell you that. But, but all those dudes in suits that practice diversification, they didn't get rich because they diversified. They got rich because they instilled fear, uncertainty, and anxiety in a bunch of other people who then gave them their money and agreed to pay 2% management fee and give them 20% of the upside. So if you think about classic Hollywood, uh, uh, classic Wall Street masters of the universe, they will manage your money. You know, you're a retiree, you're a doctor, a dentist, you give them your money, you give them your life savings. They charge you 2% a year, and then they take 20% of the upside, and then they tell you that it's too dangerous for you to own Apple, it's too dangerous to own Bitcoin, it's too dangerous to own Google. You can't do that, that's irresponsible. So here's what happens next. You give them a million dollars at two and 20, and if you actually understand statistics or financial modeling, and then you just take that million dollars and invest it in the S&P index, and the S&P were to go up 10% a year, they get 4% a year and you get the other six. Which means that you just gave them 40% of your money. You had a million dollars and you just gave them $400,000 and you got the other 600,000 back. And so, if you ask yourself the question, who are the people telling you diversify? It's the people selling you the diversified funds or they, they hold themselves out as these brilliant diversifiers. And what they're really doing is taking all your money, right? And, uh, and on the other hand, name a billionaire that got rich by diversifying. Jeff Bezos didn't get rich by diversifying. Mark Zuckerberg didn't get rich by diversifying. You know, uh, Steve Ballmer didn't get rich by diversifying. You know, like Steve Jobs didn't get rich by diversifying. Pretty much, you know, Elon Musk didn't get rich by diversifying, right? You could go on and on, you know, and like, let's take even Warren Buffett. You know the most profitable trade Warren Buffett ever made? He bought Apple stock and he made more money. on. They bought Apple stock 20 years late and, or whatever, and they made more money on Apple than they made on every other stock investment in the history of the company. And they made it in like five years. And it was concentrated position, like by the dominant mobile company, right? And um, so I, I think that people are misled and they don't really, th they don't think about it much, right? If everything, by the way, if you're, it's no good to diversify if everything's correlated. For example, you could buy every possible company in Nigeria, but if they're all correlated to the Nigerian Nayara and the currency collapses, what good was diversification? So you, you, you really have to think about this. It's, it's like, I, I wouldn't say that there aren't successful people that happen to be diversified. I would just say that oftentimes this is a mantra that's, that's brainlessly recited to give people an excuse to not think. And it's, it's, you know, it's like, well, I gotta diversify, so I own 37 different things. So that means you don't really understand any of the 37 things you own. And, and I, I would advocate you should spend a thousand hours obsessing over each thing you own. And if you're the kind of person that can spend 5,000 hours and spend a thousand hours on each of five things, then, you know, good for you. Maybe you'll end up owning Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, right? And then maybe you'll say all four worked. And, and that's not so bad. But, um, you know, I just... I'm skeptical of a, a lot of the other, you know, ideas that circulate and, and they're just kind of mindlessly repeated over and over and over again. What happened a decade ago was the digital transformation of all those things. It was the, it was the digital transformation of information. And uh, it created trillions and trillions of dollars of wealth. And you could have actually made a lot of money if you jumped on that wave. What you have to do is pick the winner, right? There's, there's a thousand digital retail companies. There's one Amazon. You don't want the Amazon of Singapore. You don't want the Amazon of Nigeria. You want the Amazon. 
right? So you see, hey, you have to pick that. There's one Apple, there's one Amazon, there's one Google, there's one Facebook. If you picked it, there's one Microsoft. If you pick it, you win. You pick the number three, you probably lose. And so that was a big way. But by 2020, that wasn't, that was still unstoppable. Like the Magnificent Seven has been an okay investment. Like if you bought all those stocks in 2020, you probably doubled the performance of the S&P index. The S&P index is up like 40, 45%. If you picked the best five companies in the index, well, you double that performance. If you picked the rest, the rest had no return. Okay, so there's 493 or 490 companies that don't return anything. They're all losers. There's five to 10 companies that are the winners. And if you pick the winners, yeah, you do better than the index. If you pick the index, at least it, you brainlessly got some winners. But of course, Bitcoin outdid them by a factor of three or a factor of two to three. So, so uh, why was that? And the answer is by 2020, 98% of the people didn't, they didn't disagree with you if you said Amazon was a good idea. See, by, by 2020, most people agreed with you that Amazon was a good idea. Most people, most people thought, well, Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, they're monopolies and, and Microsoft. Once everybody knows they're monopolies, once everybody knows they're unstoppable, once everybody knows that they need them, then you're not going to get a 10x or 100x performance anymore because all the capital has already moved into the market. Now, there's two problems with uh, investing in those magnificent seven stocks today, in my opinion. Uh, and the one problem is everybody knows they're good and everybody knows they, they're essential. And so the market is adjusted. And that, that means that they're not undervalued. The, the second problem is the regulators and politicians will increasingly target them, their targets, because they're companies whether it's targets to unionize or targets to fine or targets to regulate or targets to embargo or lever or censor, or, you know, they're just, or tax, they're just targets. And that's challenging. Uh, and the third is their companies. And this is related to the second problem, but it's, it's a much deeper idea, which is a company is a capital structure and the capital structure has a finite capacity for you to invest in. So for example, uh, if the stock of a company triples overnight, like Meta tri doubled the other day, if it doubles then, and it's, it's valued based on cash flows, and then the cash flows have to double. If you double it again, the cash flows have to double again. If you increase the stock value by a factor of 10, expectations for cash generation have to increase by a factor of 10. That makes them even stronger cash derivatives in a period when you have inflationary money. So, so you're, you're valued on cash flows, the money is losing its value, and so the debasement of the currency strikes at the heart of the value proposition of the company as a store of value. So that makes them increasingly risky and fragile. And that's exacerbated by the fact that there's massive political pressure in a conventional financial environment for them to return their capital to their shareholders. So when Meta stock doubles, they announce a $55 billion stock buyback. And then they announce a dividend. And that's, what, that's Apple's playbook. Apple has been buying their stock back and dividending out their excess cash. Well, the problem is the company is valued or the stock is valued almost exclusively on the P&L. Or that is to say the discounted value of the cash flows as expected into the next future, the next decade of cash flows. Now, if they took all their cash and they bought Bitcoin, let's think about like Meta, if they didn't give back the 55 billion, what if they actually bought $55 billion worth of Bitcoin? Now think about that for a second. Like if they even bought $10 billion worth of Bitcoin and they announced that to the marketplace, Bitcoin would triple. They would have $30 billion of property. It would be, and it would be going up 20 to 30% a year. So within a few years, they'd have $100 billion of property. If they, if they actually executed the $50 billion buy, you would have $150 billion worth of property within 24 months. And that $150 billion would be accreting a 20 to 30% a year, but let's just say 20% a year. 
you're going to generate $30 billion of investment income per year, compounding. And so now you end up with a company where the balance sheet is worth hundreds of billions of dollars, not just the P&L. And so most of these companies, they don't have property, so they're valued on cash flows. And that means there's a store of value this decade. That's increasingly risky, right? It's, it's, it's probably the best conventional idea anybody has. But, you know, having the best conventional idea is, you know, it's like buying the best building in a war zone. It's like, okay, well, it's the best you could do, but you're still losing. Or it's like, it's finding the most comfortable cabin on the Titanic. <laughs> the ship is sinking. You have the presidential suite. Good for you. Now, now I, I, I think that's hyperbolic in this case. I don't think the Magnificent Seven are sinking, but I think that when you're stuck in a certain frame of reference, there are just various degrees of mediocre outcome. There isn't winning. In order to win or get an, an, an excellent outcome, you have to think outside the box. And that means if you're in a, if you're in a war zone, you gotta leave. If you're buying currencies that are denominated in a collapsing currency, you know, whether it's a peso or a lira or a naira or whatever, you gotta get out of that currency. If you're buying currency derivatives denominated in dollars, forward discounted, and you know the dollar is going to be inflated at 7 8% a year, well, that's your hurdle rate. You're going to have to grow your cash flows faster than 8% a year. Now, how many companies can grow their cash flows 15% a year for the next 20 years? Okay, now you might find some. Now, the question is, can you protect them against politicians, foreign and domestic? Right? If, if your local politicians like you will, you know, will the foreign politicians like you or vice versa. So, so those kind of investments, they're, they're very fragile. And I think you got to be aware of them. And so I guess that's why I did what I did a decade ago. It, it paid off really well. But when 2020 came, the entire world changed. And the question is, what's the next thing? Yeah, Bitcoin's the next thing. But Bitcoin is like, I've said it before, it's kind of like Apple or Google in, you know, in 2010, misunderstood, everybody needs them, nobody can stop them. But it's a bit better because Bitcoin, Bitcoin is an asset class and so its target use case is store of value for the civilization, which means that there's no reason why it doesn't subsume gold and gold's worth 10 trillion as a store of value. Why can't it subsume real estate at 100 trillion? Why can't it subsume all store of value property, which gets you to two, three, four hundred trillion? And, uh, and the more valuable it gets, the more useful it gets, right? The fundamental big idea, and this, it's very difficult to explain this to people, but if Bitcoin increases in value by a factor of 100 because people buy it as a store of value, it's 100 times more valuable. Whereas if Apple stock is 100 times uh, higher priced, the cash flows in the next 20 years have to keep up. Right? And people that criticize Bitcoin, they say, well, it's got no cash flows. Well, that's not the defect. That's the feature. It's not a liability. It's the fact that it's something that is not valued on cash flows means it's never going to miss its quarterly cash flow expectations. Right? In fact, it's a reflection of the cash flows that have flowed into it. And so, so Bitcoin is just a much more powerful idea. It's, it's the digital transformation of capital. Right? It's not digital information. It's digital energy. Right? And energy is matter, energy is capital, energy is property, right? And so Bitcoin is digital energy. Google and Apple and Amazon, they were about all about digital transformation of information. And I, I think that was the 30 years, it was a 30 year trend. I just think we're kicking off another 30 year cycle. And Bitcoin is, is this big driver of this digital transformation of energy 
I use the word energy because energy is conservative, right? It can neither be destroyed nor created. There's conservation of energy, just like capital, right? I send you a billion dollars, you get the billion, I don't have the billion, right? Whereas when I send you my record collection, you've got the records, I've still got the records, you see? I send you my photographs, you've got the photos, I've got the photos. So information is non-conservative, energy is conservative, Bitcoin represents the digital transformation of capital, right? Most people don't agree. Most people don't even understand, right? Right, the beauty of this is, it's not that they understand and they disagree. It's like you say Bitcoin is digital energy and even the people in the crypto space will disagree with me. They're like, what do you mean? No, it isn't, it can't be. Like, that's not what it is. They don't get it, right? And so that's a paradigm shift, so profound, that you can say it in front of someone, and unless you have a hundred hours to show them a hundred examples and it can conduct a Socratic tutorial for them and answer their hundred questions and show them three-dimensional visualizations and then make a hundred connections. If you don't have that time, they just look at you, they blank, they disagree, they, they misunderstand, and so they don't buy, but that's exactly what you want. You want something which can't be stopped the fact they don't agree and they don't understand doesn't mean it's stoppable any more than I start a fire in Chicago and it's burning. It's like you might not understand there's a fire. You might not know fire. You might wish there isn't a fire, but the fire's coming, right? It's not stoppable, right? It's a chain reaction. And this is a chain reaction right now. That's what makes it, I think, such a compelling proposition. I think the risk reward proposition for Bitcoin in the year 2024 is um, is better than any other time in the history of the asset because because you have institutional adoption, you have regulatory clarity, you see capital coming into the space, and yet still you can do the survey yourself. Ask a hundred of your friends if if they're fully invested in Bitcoin and if they understand it. And if 95 say no, I, I would say do your own research. But Bitcoin's 15 years old, so let's look at other great investments. 15 years after Manhattan was founded, was it a good investment? We could just start for, we could start 200 years after Mount Manhattan was founded. In 1776, roll the clock forward, 1791. Was it a good investment? In, was real estate in Manhattan in 1791 a good investment? Was it a good investment in 1865 after the Civil War? Was it a good investment in 1970? Was it a good investment 15 years afterwards in, you know, 1995? Like, it's, was it a good investment in London 20 years ago? Like, 2,000 years after the Romans showed up in London, was it a good investment to buy London property? Right? I mean, these are scarce, desirable properties, right? It's, it's 15 years late is not late. Right? That, the difference between the winners and the losers is the winners buy something valuable and the losers are afraid. Right? The losers are afraid to buy the valuable thing because it's too expensive. New York real estate was the most expensive real estate in the United States 300 years late. Right? It's, it's always been the most expensive. Apple Computer was uh, founded, I think, 1976, around then. 15 years after Apple Computer was founded, was it a good investment, right? Uh, check the price of Apple stock in 1993 or 1996. I think in 1998, you know, Michael Dell told, told the board they should shut it down, give the money back to the shareholders. But, but the truth is, you know, at many, many points in time, it was uh, a good investment. I think, uh, you know, as I'd said, the real key is to understand what is Bitcoin's use case. It's, use ca it's digital capital. Well, how big is that? $400 trillion? Right, how much capital is, is locked up in real estate, equity, currency, bonds, collectibles, trophy assets, precious metals in the year 2024? 
right? It's pr probably half the value of most uh, residential real estate is the monetary premium. It's the capital. So, like, how, how do you know this? I, I give you a little test. Uh, go to Miami Beach, go up and down the beach, and then count the number of lights on in a condo building on the beach. Or go to, go to Monaco and count the number of lights on. And what you'll find is that uh, 80 to 90 percent of all of the condos don't have lights on at night. So people have huge amounts of capital tied up in these, uh, these idle assets. And, and there's a lot of reasons for them, but one reason is because they feel like their money is safer there. So in the 20th century, people basically bought sports teams. I mean, ask yourself, what do rich people own when they get rich? They bought sports teams, they bought real estate, they bought companies, they bought land, they bought timber rights, they bought oil rights, they bought gold, they bought you know, bonds, they just bought stuff, why? because they knew if they left their money in the bank, it was going to dwindle away. Buy anything. They buy Picassos, they buy art, right? They buy, they buy stuff. So there was never a perfect digital capital. There was never a digital instrument where I could, like if, if you were a rich Russian and you had a choice between buying a bunch of real estate in Moscow or buying Bitcoin, well, with uh, ex post facto hindsight, looking back the last 30 years. Okay, now let's play that out and you're a rich Nigerian. Now you're a rich, you know, a Turk. Now you're rich in Lebanon, right? If you, and, and we don't have to be rich. You can, anybody with any amount of money anywhere in the world, right? You know, you've got the last hundred years of history. You live in Germany in 1930. What do you want, a building or Bitcoin? You know, you live in you live in Argentina. What do you want? You want to own land? You want to own a building? You want a company? You want Bitcoin? The currency is going to collapse five times in 140 years. Five times, right? Okay, so this is why we want to study history. If you study history, you're going to find that the currency collapsed thousands of times. In fact, on average, it collapses everywhere. <laughs> Probably, it collapses everywhere on average every 50 years in the history of the world. And that's maybe me being charitable. So, is it too late? Well, can you actually take all of your property, put it in your pocket and leave the country on one day notice if you need to? If not, then you're probably not too late, right? So. If you go through that exercise, you can't take your building with you. You can't take your bars of gold with you. You can't take your stock shares with you. You know, you people for a while, they bought paintings thinking I'll roll them up, but you know, it might not be the easy to, you know, and the average person can't buy Picassos that, and they're not quite exactly at the price point. How do you buy $237 of Picasso a week, right? So, so Bitcoin represents digital property. What's the value of digital property? Hundreds of trillions of dollars. Is it overvalued? Not yet, it's a trillion dollars right now. So when it's a hundred times more valuable than it is right now, will it be overvalued? Not likely, it's probably still gonna be appreciating faster than every other thing you can buy. Why? Because it's better than every other thing you can buy. Show me a hotel you can put in your pocket and teleport. Right. A billion dollars of gold caught is like 3,000 pounds, right? How, how are you going to move that, right? Right? Give me a company that's going to last through the next three CEOs, right? Do you know who the third CEO will be after the, the one that runs the company now? And do you, do you trust that person? Right? The S&P 500, haven't we established there's a 99% failure rate? These are the winners. There's a 99% failure rate to generate shareholder value amongst the 500 best companies in the world. Now, if there's a 99% failure rate amongst the 500 best companies in the world, then what's the failure rate amongst the 100 million companies in the world? And, you know, and, and the, what's the most successful nation, nation state currency in the history of the world? Well, if it's the dollar, the dollar's lost 99.8% of its value in 100 years. Maybe 99.9% .9 of its value. Debate. You could debate whether it's 99.8 or 99.9% .9 of its value. Every other currency in every other country lost 100%. So, 
if you're sitting around wondering, is Bitcoin overvalued? The question is, overvalued versus, versus what? Right? You're, you're going to buy something, right? You're owning something in lieu of Bitcoin. What is that something which is better? Right? That's the real question. Because um, not selling is buying, but not buying is selling, right? And, and you basically got a certain amount of economic energy. It's deployed somewhere, right? And the question is, what are you invested in that you think is better? And I, I think everybody's got to answer that question themselves. But, you know, like if you owned a, a football team, like what's the odds that people are just still going to watch football in 250 years? And what's the odds that you can put the football team in your pocket and leave the country? Not high, right? I mean, and what's the odds that, you know, you get attacked by, what if there's some law that says that you're liable for the, for the physical damage and the emotional harm to the football players? And, you know, if someone gets hurt playing football, you have to pay a $100 million settlement, right? That happens. Or even better would be, what happens if someone goes to a football game, watches it, and is traumatized by all the violence, and they form a class action lawsuit, and they sue you? Mightn't that happen? It happens all the time. <laughs> right? Look at the history of opioids. Look at the history of cigarettes. Look at what's going on right now at congressional hearings around social media. At some point, you'll have trial attorneys suing tech companies because someone used a website and something bad happened to them, right? So there are a lot of risks, no matter what you invest in. If you think you don't have risk, you're simply ignorant of the risk you're currently embracing. And I, I think that uh, once someone understands fully all their range of risk, then your conclusion is no, it's not too late to buy Bitcoin. I think this is going to be a good year for Bitcoin. I think we started out the year with the ETF approval, and that was a big milestone. I think that the success of the ETFs is another, uh, another milestone. Uh, I think that the halving in April will be a third positive milestone. I think those three things are going to drive momentum, and I think, I think all the marketing wars between the Wall Street firms is, is, uh, is going to be positive, and I think that I think the assets being normalized throughout the mainstream investment community. And so I think it was keep generating momentum from here. I think it's um, it's also worthwhile, I think, to make one point. I think that we're living through the Bitcoin gold rush era. And I think the Bitcoin gold rush era started January 2024. And I think it runs until around November 2034. So it's about 10 years, and I'll tell you why. Because 93.5% or so of the Bitcoin was mined at the beginning of this period. But in November of 2034, 99% of all the Bitcoin that will ever be issued will have been issued. And so that, that halving is, is uh, very symbolic. People talk about Bitcoin, you know, issuance coming out over the next hundred years, all the way till 2140. But the truth of the matter is, the last hundred years, you're only getting one percent. So think, of, and and actually, of that one percent, 90 basis points of it is coming in the in the 12 years that follow 2034, and then it's 10 basis points, a tenth of a percent. But but practically speaking. All of the block rewards are de minimis starting in 2034. It's, it's, you know, 1% over 100 years may as well be nothing because, you know, the daily volatility and the daily trading volume is going to render that to be somewhere between third order, fourth order, fifth order of magnitude. Um, so that being the case, really, um, this 10 years is your best chance to get Bitcoin, right? This is the gold rush because this is the period where there's still a lot of FUD. There's still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, people still aren't sure. They don't understand digital energy. They don't understand digital capital. They don't understand digital property. There's a lot of debate in the community. Is Bitcoin a currency or is it a property? Or, you know, there, there's massive debate. And a lot of people say, well, it's a currency. And since it's not legal tender or 
because it, it doesn't move fast enough or I can't buy coffee with it, it's not a good currency. So there's a lot of confusion in the crypto community. Um, there's a lot of mainstream regulators, they think it's currency. So you see bankers say, oh, it's a currency, but it's not a good currency because I can't buy coffee with it. I can't buy things online with it. And it's too, it's too volatile. And they think that's a criticism. And so they criticize it. And then people that think that they know what they're talking about, they hear some famous person say, well, Bitcoin is not a good currency and, you know, or the government will ban it or it's not as good as the dollar or something. And so they get afraid. And they say, well, then I trust that guy, so I'm not going to buy it. So a lot of people are criticizing it for the wrong reason. A lot of people misunderstand it, you know, and, and that creates lots of chaos, misinformation, stupid, you know, stupid, misleading stories in mainstream media. It creates, uh, it creates like bad takes on Twitter. It creates all sorts of confusion amongst Wall Street analysts. And so all of that fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and just basic confusion, and then misunderstanding, it, that causes uh, a slow growth in demand, right? Like demand is growing, but imagine how much faster it would be growing if everybody had spent 100 hours, right? Right, the people that criticize it, there's no way Warren Buffett spent 100 hours studying Bitcoin, right? There's no, there's not likely that everyone that criticizes it spent 100 hours studying it. They haven't read the Bitcoin standard. They probably haven't listened to 20, 30, 40 hours of podcasts, right? So the critics are, are misinformed and the mainstream investors, they have all the money, right? Nine, there's $900 trillion of wealth out there. There's only $1 trillion in Bitcoin. So 99.9% .9 of the money of the wealth is not invested, right, in the asset class. So a lot of people that don't understand what this is have a lot of money. And yet we've got a 10-year period when there's going to be an explosive increase in education. Right? Is Bitcoin, Bitcoin's going to go up. And as the price goes up, more people are going to get asked and they're going to like reject. They're like, stop asking me. I hate talking about this. Like, we don't, we don't like it because it's not, it's like gold. It doesn't generate cash flows or they don't understand. If you don't understand uh, perfect money, right? What, what's, what's wrong with gold? Gold has admissions. Gold is inflationary. That's why it doesn't work. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand why digital gold is better than gold. So you don't understand Bitcoin, you don't understand money, and then you haven't really thought very deeply about property theory or capital theory. So you definitely don't understand digital capital, which means you don't understand digital energy, which means that when someone asks you, you're gonna buy it, your answer is, of course, I'm not gonna buy it. I don't get it. But what I say to people, right, like, if everybody understood, if everybody read all these books, if they listened to all your podcasts, if they listened to all my podcasts, if they thought about it for a few hundred hours, tomorrow they would wake up, they would all buy Bitcoin and Bitcoin would be $5 million a coin. And then we'd be doing this podcast and you would say, Mike, all my, all, all the comments from all my followers are, is it too late? <laughs> and I would say, I would say, well, it's too late for you to get insanely rich. You're not going to get 100x, right? If you buy Bitcoin at 50,000 when it's 500, uh, 5 million, you're going to be bragging to your kids that you got 100x your return, right? So it's going to be too late for that. But it's not too late to buy it because it's still better to buy the thermodynamically sound digital asset, which doesn't have all of the liabilities of real estate, stocks, or bonds it's still going to go up in value faster than the S&P index. It's still gonna be a better after-tax return than owning sovereign debt. It's still gonna be better than owning physical property subject to acts of God, you know, force majeure, and all the other physical limitations. So it's still gonna be the best investment. It's just not gonna be the investment that got you the 100X return that you were gonna brag about. And so, there's no reason to worry, right? Or fret. You don't want people to figure this out, right? Like, like if they figure it out, you won't, 
you have 10 years during which you can work and you can buy Bitcoin while everybody else disagrees with you and doesn't understand it because they're intellectually lazy or they're a different generation, right? So that it's like me saying it's 1905 and in 15 years, everybody's going to have an automobile and now you know. Okay, well, you have 15 years to get rich in the automobile business, figure out are you going to set up the dealership in New York City? Are you going to start a company? Are you going to be a salesperson? What are you going to do? You have 15 years. Figure it out. This is better than that. But right, this is a 15, 10, 15 year head start. Um, and, uh, you know, I had this analogy. It's like you could be working at a McDonald's. You could be working for $10 an hour, right? But if you're sweeping the $10 an hour in an asset that goes up by a factor of 100, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're getting paid a thousand dollars an hour. Okay, so how long do you want to work at a thousand dollars an hour? Well, you want to work at a thousand dollars an hour as long as you possibly can, because once people figure it out, then you go back to your ten dollar an hour job, right? So, so we're in the gold rush period. Uh, people are, when they think about it, they're going to realize this is this is the period during which everybody in the world started to realize Bitcoin is digital capital. And there's capital. There's a digital transformation of money, and that uh, you want to hop on top of that. You you want to exploit that. And there's a thousand ways to do it. Maybe it's just work really hard at your job and buy Bitcoin. Maybe it's start a company. Maybe it's do something different. You decide, right? But I I, I don't ever regret any stacking I did. I mean, we bought Bitcoin, at, you know, below ten thousand. We bought Bitcoin probably above sixty thousand. I, I mean, at the end of the day. We never know when the world wakes up, gets rational, and then it runs through the all-time high, and then we regret not, not having bought more. I, I would encourage anybody that thinks, maybe I'm too late. I mean, I, I think I would say, well, maybe you just haven't studied this enough, right? You don't, gotta, don't give me your money if you're not confident. Give me your time. You know, and if you, if you don't want to invest the time, maybe you don't care about money that much. It must not mean, it must not matter to you that much. If it matters to you, then you spend enough time to figure out whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. And there's plenty of information out there for you to come to your own conclusion. In every generation, you have to consider the transformational technologies that remake the world. You know, whether it's the internal combustion engine or whether it's a computer chip or whether it's the internet or whether it's the airplane or whether it's the, the piano, you know, like, <laughs> figure out, or, or the electric guitar, right? What's the transformational technology? Um, I rather think right now it looks like the transformational technologies for the next 20 to 30 years are digital intelligence, that is AI, and then digital money or digital energy, which is Bitcoin, right? And the idea that, you know, you can embed digital intelligence into a car, a plane, a drone, a robot, a website, a product, a service, an AI, that's a big idea. And certainly there are going to be massive fortunes made. And, and, and if you understand how to embed digital intelligence, right, there's going to be a demand for that. And with regard to digital energy, right? The idea you can embed digital, digital energy into a product, a service, a website, a company, a country, you know, an institution, right? Uh, is a big idea. Um, so you ought to think about how you might take advantage of that. Now, there may be other things, right? In the, in, in, uh, the domain of medicine or, or, or physics or the like. I'm not an expert on all. I mean, these are two obvious transformational technologies. I would say pick the thing that you love, the thing that you're most interested in. And then I would say focus, because the most common mistake I think people make is, well, well, there's two mistakes. One is they pick the last generation technology. Right, it's the thing that made your father or your grandfather or your great grandfather famous, successful, rich, powerful, right, is probably not going to work for you. <laughs> you know, you, you're not going to fight the next war with the same weapons you fought World War II with, and they didn't fight with the same weapons they fought the Civil War with. And 
you're not going to get rich the same way John D. Rockefeller got rich. So, so don't try to do what's been done. Uh, no matter, it doesn't matter how hard you work. Uh, no amount of work, right, is is going to allow you to overcome a um, a, a technology disadvantage, right? Nobody cares how hard you work if you're working with a hammer, trying to hammer your way through a mountain. So that's the first thing you don't want to do. But the second thing is, oftentimes people, they find that technology and they have a modicum of success and they get going on that platform. And then they declare victory and they think, they, they take that for granted. So then they go to find the next success. So, it's, so they want to conquer the second thing and then the third thing and then the fourth thing and then the fifth thing. And what happens, it, it might be as something as simple as you're successful on YouTube and so then you decide you're going to do TikTok. But TikTok is different than YouTube. And so, you know, you, you find yourself basically creating mediocre TikTok things and then your YouTube content gets mediocre too. And then someone else, you know, offers you a third thing and you decide that's what you're going to do. And pretty soon you're doing three things and everything's mediocre. And gradually, you know, your, your customer base, your fan base falls off, you know, your support falls off because you diluted your focus. And I think, um, I think here's the phrase I would leave you with, right? I, nobody fails because they pursue bad ideas to the detriment of their good one. They fail because they pursue good ideas to the detriment of their great one. Right, so like figure out the one thing that you can be great at and then don't make the mistake of diluting your focus and your effectiveness because you're good. It's like, don't be Michael Jordan, the basketball great, and then go play baseball. You know, you'd be a professional baseball player, you know? One in a million people could be a professional baseball player. But you see, trading the one in a billion to be one in a million is a mistake. Uh, you know, and he, yeah, he figured it out, right? Like, like uh, hopefully you figure it out. The tragedy is you have something which is going to work and then you get distracted, right? And uh, a lot of these people, Look at Apple computers, like Steve, Steve Jobs. It's like, at the point everybody's written you off, the difference is they don't quit. Like they don't give up ever, ever, ever. They just keep going, laser-like focus. And it's easy to say, but you know, how many people can keep laser eyes on Twitter for four years? <laughs> you know, that, that's the joke. How, you know, if you went and counted the number of people that put laser eyes and then they took them off after three months or three weeks or three days, or three years. And of course the irony is, right, you can't even get a college degree in less than four years. You can't be a doctor without less, without 10 years of work. But a lot of people, they just expect it to work in 10 weeks or 10 months. And, uh, and I would say, you know, my advice to anybody is, is find something that gives you a technology, let, uh, technology edge or lever a bit. The, the ability to create something which impacts the most, um, the most amount of capital or the most number of people, you want to you wanna have the maximum impact, whatever that is, the max leverage. And then once you figure that out, relentlessly refine your craft, 10,000 hours. And then, after, by the way, 10,000 hours to become the great guitar player or the great piano player or the great podcaster or, or the great whatever it is. After you do that, then go do it. And then after you get recognized as being successful, don't go on to the next thing, right? <laughs> Focus upon the thing, right? It's keep doing the thing. Don't take your success for granted. Because I think, I think we see all the time people, they take their success for granted, and then they go off to conquer the next, uh, you know, the next objective thinking that somehow it'll be just as easy and somehow, and it's important for me to do it. And what happens is 
that second thing dilutes the first thing, and by the third thing, they've diluted everything, and by the fourth thing, they're just dropping all the balls, and everything comes crashing down. And there's somebody else in the world, they're gonna put in the 10,000 hours, and they're not gonna get distracted, and they're gonna eat you, because it's a very Darwinian world, and it's very competitive, and if, if you're not insanely good at something, it's not clear that anybody's gonna need you for anything. Um, but, you know, money is uh, it's, uh, a store of value, a, a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and then there's a fourth characteristic that we don't talk about. It's the, it's the thing that's not said. It's a system of control. So certain monies are easier to control than others. For example, you know, we, we talk about gold as money, but you ever try to carry um, a gold bar through an airport? Very heavy. Uh, yeah, try it next time. Um, you know, they won't let you through, right? In fact, if you tried to carry $100,000 of gold through an airport, not only would you not get through, but the assumption would be you're a criminal, you stole the gold, and they would just take it and keep it without a court order. Now, try to carry $100,000 of cash through the airport. <laughs> you ever try that? Put it in a bag and just... Uh, you can put it in a bag, and as you're walking through the TSA check or the, uh, the x-ray machine, just nonchalantly say to the officer, yeah, I'm carrying $100,000 of money onto the airplane, right? You won't get through. Now, not only will you not get through, they'll just take your money, right? They'll just take it, and the assumption will be you stole it, okay? So cash is a unit of control. Now, put $100,000 in a bank, and try to wire it uh, to someone, or just take it out, and they're gonna ask you why. Tell them it's none of their business. <laughs> uh, try to send it to someone uh, privately. Like, tell them you just wanna send it to a, a numbered Swiss bank account, right? See how that works. That won't work, right? Uh, that's a system of control. Um, a couple of sta stable coins have been getting shut down. Paxos's BUSD got a Wells notice. They got shut down, and Custodia tried to launch a bank, uh, and they wanted to issue AVITs. AVITs were digital dollars, and they were digital dollars that were going to circulate on crypto networks. And, uh, and the regulators denied that banking license, and it's about a 70-page denial letter, very articulate, and I read it all. I read thousands, I, I read all of the crypto uh, legislation and all of the crypto uh, litigation. So if you dig into that denial letter, which is very well written uh, and articulate, what is very clear is that is is the regulators say we're not going to allow the bank to form because we don't want to issue someone we don't want someone to issue digital dollars that will circulate on crypto networks non KYC, what, you know evading our money law our anti money laundering rules our anti terrorism rules our, our know your customer rules, so. Uh, it's clear that the regulators uh, reject with prejudice the idea that you can circulate large sums of dollars without reporting that. Now, that's a political football, right? Because a lot of people in this country think that you should own your own money and you should have financial privacy and you ought to be able to do what you want with your money. There's another group of people that don't agree, right? Uh, Ted Cruz is on the side of freedom. You ought to own your own money. Now, it turns out that um, if your money's in a bank, you're not going to be able to circulate it freely. It's controlled. Um, and uh, on the other hand, Bitcoin is the one network you can't control. Uh, you know, Ted Cruz's famous line is, I like Bitcoin for the same reason the Chinese don't like it. They can't control it. Mm -hmm. Nobody can control Bitcoin. So if you're, if you're insecure about being able to own your own money, do you own it? And can you actually use it? without asking somebody's permission, then uh, the solution is not gold, it's not silver coins, it's not stacks of cash, it's not money in a bank in the US, it's certainly not money in a bank in Lebanon, Argentina, anywhere in Africa. Those banks won't let you, they won't let you take your money out of the bank. <laughs> Go look at Nigeria. 
$42 a day, that's how much you can take out of the bank. They're keeping your money. So the one network uh, that you have that gives you a decent chance of owning your own money and then being able to spend it the way you want is Bitcoin. So I'm not worried about Bitcoin. I do think that um, there'll be a massive political fight over CBDCs. There's a technical challenge. Our government doesn't know how to issue a CBDC. We don't know how to issue digital currency. The people that are issuing digital dollars are the cryptocurrency mm. people, right? You know, Paxos knows how to issue a digital dollar, right? And the regulators sent them a Wells notice saying, shut it down. So the private market knows how to issue digital dollars. Uh, the government doesn't, the EU doesn't, the feds don't. And so even if they wanted to, they can't technically right now without somebody else's help. But as long as Congress is split, right, uh, it seems to me quite clear there's a large faction, uh, by the way, on the Democratic and the Republican side. I mean, Robert F. Kennedy, I don't think, is in favor of a CBDC, yep. nor is Ron DeSantis in favor of a CBDC. So there are a lot of free thinking politicians in both parties that are adamantly against having a system of control where the government can decide how you, you know, it used to be $10,000 was the cutoff of the report, right? It used to be you had to report when you wired $10,000, and that was back when $10,000 was worth something, right? It used to be, I think it, it dates back, what, 30, 50 years or something? So it used to be $10,000 was a lot of money, and then they kept the, the $10,000 limit, and uh, inflation creeped up, and pretty soon $10,000 is, is not nearly so much money. And what we're seeing is an uh, encroachment of that, where now people are starting to lobby for the government to get a report on everything spent more than $600. You know, politicians have shown themselves quite capable of interfering in your private affairs, and, and the last three years have shown anything. They've shown that people can come up with some justification to tell you how many people can sit at your dinner table on Thanksgiving, right? And, and so there'll be some of them. I, I don't think that politically it's going to fly in the near term. In, in the next two to four years, I don't see consensus at the political level to impose a CBDC. But I think, so I think it's, it's like that persistent boogeyman where people say, oh, it's coming. And the result is is uh, more interest in the antidote to it. So I, I, I don't think it's bad for Bitcoin. I think it's good for Bitcoin. I do think we ought to be concerned about money being used as a system of control is very disturbing. Well, I don't, I mean, to be clear, I don't expect it to happen. I, I, I don't think uh, that uh, there is consensus in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party to implement a CBDC. I don't think they know how to do it. I think there's resistance to it. Um, I, I think that what's going on right now is there's a regulatory crackdown on crypto. And so what, what, what is happening is the administration is, is cracking down on crypto exchanges. It's cracking down on crypto securities. It's cracking down on some of the crypto tokens and it's cracking down on cryptocurrencies. And by currency, I mean a stable coin, like a dollar circulating. And I think that that's uh, creating quite a, a lot of sound and fury and friction and anxiety in the industry. I think, uh, I, I think it'll continue. There is no coherent digital asset framework that's been offered by any regulator. There isn't any coherent digital assets framework offered by any legislator. We're nowhere near, that, like there's not a bill we're debating that if it gets voted on, will solve the problem. There is no bill. Got it. <laughs> okay, and so, the, you know, the talk about CBDCs uh, gets people, you know, quite spun up, rightfully so, but I think the story here is CBDCs are going to be a non-starter in the free world. And even in uh, the place that's closest to it is China, I suppose. And, uh, and so I, I really think that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a Chinese concept. And I don't really think 
in the free world, we want to be like the Chinese. And, and I think ultimately, uh, both sides of the aisle will agree on that. They won't agree on other things. They, they, they won't agree on private money. Like, for example, uh, probably the Republicans uh, and the conservatives would be in favor of private companies issuing digital currency and letting it circulate. And, uh, and on the other side of the aisle, they're a bit more conservative and they, you know, they would say, well, we only want banks to issue currency that report to us on every material transaction. But um, none of the banks were able to issue a stable coin either. Signature Bank was unable to issue a stable coin. Silvergate Bank was unissu uh, unable to issue a stable coin. And Custodia wanted to be an FDIC approved bank. They were unable to issue a stable coin. And, uh, and when you ask those banking executives, they said, well, the regulars wouldn't let us. I mean, it's, it, this is the struggle of, you know, control versus freedom that's as old as time, right? In every society, in, you know, in the, hum, in the history of the human race, every society, there's always people that want to impose control on the people, and there's another group that want freedom. I, I've, been, I've been reading Conceived in Liberty, which is Mary Rothbard's history of the American colonies before the Revolutionary War. And it's hundreds of chapters, non-stop struggle. Someone wants to control a colony. They want to tell you what to think. They want to tell you, you know, what, you know, who God is. They want to define religion. They want to impose taxes. They want to seize your property. They want to tax your property. They want to impose monopolies. And then there's another group fighting for freedom. And, and it was going on for hundreds of years before the Revolutionary War. I mean, there were monopolies in New York on who could bake, you know? They, they, there were tariffs on using the Hudson River to go up and down the river. There were monopolies on who could trade with the Indians. They would give you land, they would steal your land, they would tax the land, people wouldn't pay the tax, there were rebellions. It's hundreds and hundreds of struggles. So it's been going on before the revolution. It's going on in every country in the world. Today, it's certainly going on, and, and if you have any political power, I think the best way to use it is to support those that trust people are in favor of freedom, because there's, there tends to be or seems to be this never-ending tendency of governmental organizations to get stronger, and as they get stronger, they raise taxes, they funnel the taxes into the police state and the control state, and pretty soon, it's illegal to bake bread, it's illegal to row up a river. It's illegal to cross the river. It's, you know, if you have land, you have to pay tax. If you pay tax, it has to double. If, it, you know, the taxes were used, it used to be we paid tax to pay ministers to, to, to preach religious beliefs that you disagreed with. And if you, you know, if you actually laughed or kissed your wife on a Sunday, they whipped you. <laughs> You know, find you and seize your property because you were disrespectful to the Almighty Lord. And, and I'd, I'd like to say it was uh, it was unique and a one-time thing, but it wasn't. It's it's kind of the history of humanity. So it's going on today. It's it's reprehensible, and you can't see politicians that will articulate that that message that the people cannot be trusted and the government needs to control everything. Luckily, we're in Florida, where we, where we have a number of politicians that believe differently. I'm hopeful that, uh, that we'll see a backlash to the control tendencies in the political sphere that have, have manifested themselves over the past few years. And uh, CBDC is just one of those touchstones. It's not the only one. It won't be the last one. It wasn't the first one. I think gold's getting uh, demonetized by Bitcoin right now. Um, if you look at the past three years, since Mi MicroStrategy bought $250 million worth of Bitcoin in August of 2020, since that time, Bitcoin's up about 140%. Uh, the S&P's up about 20%. NASDAQ's up 10%. Gold's up 1%. Silver's down about 8%. Bonds are down 18%. Conclusion, 
right? If you, if you buy debt, govern, government debt, you're going to be bankrupt. That's why those banks are going bankrupt. All the banks had, had debt. When uh, the interest rates went through the roof, the debt traded down, and they all were technically insolvent. Um, the problem with uh, gold is, first of all, if you have, if I bought $250 million worth of gold, I can't like carry it around in my pocket. I can't take self-custody of it. I can't move it uh, anywhere. I can't transfer it to a counterparty. And so that means I have to put it in a bank. There's only a handful of banks in the world that custody it. And the banks rehypothecate the gold. So that means that um, if you wanted to sell $250 million of gold, the bank will, will sell your gold. If you want to buy it, they'll sell you paper. And the paper gold isn't backed by the actual gold. So <clears throat> you have fractional reserve banking of gold, right? That's that uh, you don't want to own an asset where the bank can sell 100x more of that asset than they own. That the whole problem with uh, fiat currency, right? If, if you look at the history of banking, it was, you know, goldsmiths, you know, goldsmiths have gold when gold was money and they give you a note. So you give me a million dollars of gold, I give you a million dollar note, you trade the notes back and forth, that's your paper money. That <clears throat> works fine as long as it's one to one. But then the guy that's the goldsmith says, holy crap, I actually can give him a million dollar note and he thinks that I've got a million dollars of gold backing it and now there's two million in the system. And then I give him a million dollars and now there's three million in the system. Now there's three times as much money there's one stack of gold worth a million bucks. Prices go through the roof. That's inflation. And eventually, you come back and you try to redeem your paper for the stack. I give you your gold back, and you try to redeem, and the gold's gone, and you try to redeem, and the gold's gone. Okay, I'm bankrupt. Oops. Okay, so uh, when did this idea of, of over-issuing paper money start? didn't start, a, you know, when Nixon defaulted on the gold standard, he wasn't the first, he was just the most famous, right? People have been defaulting on paper money probably for thousands of years. And Nixon just made it official. Yeah, so, so the issue is if gold is money and it goes into a bank, the bankers issue 10x more, more paper than there is gold. You have inflation. Eventually, right, when the French tried to redeem their, their paper dollars for gold, <clears throat> the U.S. basically closed the gold window. We defaulted on, on uh, that obligation, and we started a cycle of inflation from 1971 on that's been running 50 years. Now, when FTX failed, it was no different. The issue was people put Bitcoin on FTX, and then Sam turned around and issued 3x as much paper, you know, obligations. And when people try to withdraw the Bitcoin, he doesn't have it. He fails. When uh, Silicon Valley Bank failed, or when, when any of these other bank fails, they had a certain amount of money, you know, and then they turned around and they, and they invested it and uh, their investment was in government securities. The securities traded down. Now they were insolvent. When people try to withdraw their money, they don't actually have the money to pay them off. The banks fail. So when you look at this banking crisis, what's going on? What you've got is a bunch of banks everywhere in the world that have shaky assets, right? What, what's, what's really shaky? Well, if, if you actually hold Argentine pesos or, or Nigerian Nayara, and then you triple the supply of them every year, the value goes to zero, right? If that's your currency base or your asset base, you're going to be insolvent. When, pe when people put $10 billion into a bank backed by pesos, the peso goes to zero. The bank turns around and reloans out $20 billion. <laughs> now there's $30 billion circulating on $10 billion in the bank. When you try to withdraw the money, the bank collapses, the entire economy collapses. That's going on everywhere in the world. Uh, it's much worse in Lebanon or Nigeria or in Argentina than it is in the U.S. It's bad in the U.S., uh, but, and it's cracking on the seams with, you know, First Republic Bank and Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and, and the like. But uh, what do you conclude if you're an individual?
If you're just a, if you're a company or if you're a family or if you're an individual and you live in Zimbabwe, what would you do? Well, you can't, you're not going to buy gold and put it in the bank. The bank's just going to seize your gold. You're not even going to buy dollars and put it in the bank. The bank is going to seize your dollars. You're not going to buy local Zimbabwe dollars. They're going to zero as you stare at them. They're going to lose 10% of their value a month, right? They're just melting in your hand. So you got to buy something you can custody. So before Bitcoin, you would have bought bars of soap crates of toilet paper, you would have bought motorcycles, you would have bought a Humvee, you would have bought barrels of oil, you would have bought anything, you would have bought food, you would have bought bullets, you would have bought guns, anything tangible that you can self-custody, you would have held. Now, after Bitcoin, you now have for the first time in human history, the ability to buy not a barrel of oil, but $80 worth of Bitcoin, and you put it on your phone, and now you can go through an airport with the Bitcoin. You can't go through the, air, through the airport with a barrel of oil, right? And, and you don't, what's the big, the big difference? The difference between gold and Bitcoin and the reason Bitcoin's up 140% and gold is up 1% is the middle class family can custody their own Bitcoin and a wealthy person can, can either hold $10 million of Bitcoin in self-custody, or if I live in Africa, I can move the $10 million of Bitcoin to Monaco, Singapore, London, Paris, New York, or Miami Beach. And that is not an option you have with your gold. It's not an option you have with your dollars. When you're an Argentine citizen, and you actually call up the bank and say, hey, move my million dollars out of Argentina and send it to Switzerland. They're like, <laughs> not so I got us. No, no, they have capital controls. They have banking controls. The, the people in Lebanon with millions of dollars in Lebanese banks, they wanted to get their money out of Lebanon. It was like, well, sorry, your funds are frozen. Why? Because the bank never had the million dollars. As soon as you put the million dollars in the bank in Lebanon, they turned around and loaned it to the government. It's gone. The government spent the million dollars. You try to get the money out. The bank closes its doors, right? Is that illegal? No, because the guy that runs the government passed a law declaring a bank holiday for the good of the country, saying that we can't allow you to redeem your dollars. So the bottom line is, if you're trying to use money that requires banks, you can't trust the banks, right? You certainly can't trust the banks in Africa, in South America, and most of Asia. It used to be Americans thought they could trust American banks. Now they're realizing that they can't trust American banks. So the first order impact of the banking crisis is people think, well, maybe the money I had in the bank's going away, and so I ought to put it in a bank in cyberspace that isn't controlled by the government or by the bankers, and that's Bitcoin. The second order impact is the solution to the banking crisis is print more dollars. And if you print more dollars, the actual monetary inflation rate goes 10%, 15%, 20%. So you think, why do you think those bonds crashed? The, you know, because there are actually claims on dollars. Do you really want to hold a billion dollars of Zimbabwe dollars? What if I offered you 10 billion Zimbabwe dollars? I mean, the answer is it's going to a nickel, okay? So if the, if the paper currency keeps crashing, then you can't own anything that's currency related. You can't own a currency derivative. You need to own something that politicians can't print more of. Okay, well, that's oil, that's land. But the problem is try hauling 100,000 barrels of oil from where you are to London, where you want to be. How are you going to do that? I'll give you a billion dollars of land in Central Africa and then someone takes over with machine guns and declares that everyone with large amounts of land now loses it. That happened in Zimbabwe. You're going to pick up the land on your back and carry it to France? So it's kind of, it's simple. If people lose faith in the banks, they lose faith in the currency. When they lose faith in the currency, they lose faith in the government. 
When you lose faith in the bank, the currency, and the government, and someone says, what, do you, what can you trust? The answer is you can trust Bitcoin because you can custody your own asset, you can run your own node. And at the end of the day, even if the Chinese want to shut it down, they can't. If the Russians want to shut it down, they can't. If any nation state wants to shut it down, they can't. If the US wanted to shut it down, they can't. And so everybody wants something that they can trust that is beyond the reach of a corrupt politician, a corrupt corporate executive, or they don't have to be corrupt. They can just be well-meaning, trying to do the right thing in a misguided fashion. Mm -hmm. Money is a store of value, but, and there are multiple monies, and they're not created equal. So let me give you the world's worst money. The worst money in the world is like Argentine pesos or Venezuelan bolivars or Zimbabwe dollars or Nigerian naira. Weak money. That mo the, the official inflation rate in Argentina is 105%. But that's the official rate, which is, which is that understates it. The actual inflation rate would be higher. And if the inflation rate is wanting 100%, that means your money is losing half of its value every 12 months. That means that within 10 years, you have nothing. Okay, uh, so bad money, bad currency or bad money loses all of its value over the course of a few years. In Venezuela, you lose all your value in 36 months. In Argentina, in 10 to 20 years, the Argentine peso was one to the dollar 21 years ago. If you had, uh, if you had a million dollars 21 years ago, the Argentine peso right now is about 480 to the dollar. So that's not a 99% loss. That's a 99.8% loss, right? In, in how many years? 20? 20... 21 years. Okay, so what I'm saying is you don't have money if you have weak currency. Now let's take strong currency. Well, the strongest currency in the world is the dollar. That's not money. You're losing 99% of your wealth over the course of 90 years in the, in the U.S. dollar. Maybe more. The U.S. dollar, the only difference between the U.S. dollar and the peso is whereas it takes 20 years to lose your family's fortune in the peso, it takes about 90 years to lose your family's fortune in the dollar. Right? Uh, my, my house in Miami Beach was $100,000 in 1930. It was appraised at $46 million a few years ago. <laughs> Do the calculation. It's on a path to be worth $100 million, which means that the U.S. dollar will have lost 99.9% .9 of its value over 100 years. Warren Buffett knows this. Charlie Munger knows this. Basically, you're... The bottom line there is your money in the bank isn't money. Okay, so the answer is you shouldn't have any money in a bank, right? You're, you're basically losing 7% of all your wealth every year in a good year. If it's the dollar, you're losing 15% of your wealth in a not good year. If it's the dollar, you're absolutely losing all your money over the course of a decade. So that's that's kind of weak money, awful money is developing world money, the Lebanese pound. The Lebanese pound got devalued. I mean, you would have lost all your money in five years if you had the pound. The strongest money, decent money, okay money was gold, but not great. The strongest money in the world is Bitcoin because Bitcoin is absolutely capped at 21 million. It is global money. You could take a billion dollars of Bitcoin across a border. You can transfer it to a counterparty and no government can interdict that and nobody can inflate that. And so, so my, my answer there would be, you can't trust any bank. You can't, yeah, you certainly can't trust a bank in Lebanon. Read about Lebanese banks. You can't trust a bank in Africa. You can't trust a bank in Asia. You know, the, Bitcoin is a bank in cyberspace run by incorruptible software. It's going to keep your money. If you are incompetent, then you're going to suffer the consequences. But let, let's think about what what banking executives in the U.S. do. The U.S. banking system is the best in the world. Here's what they do. You put $100 billion into the bank, they have the deposits, 
they turn around, the, the, the Federal Reserve interest rate, short-term rate was zero. And these guys went and invested $100 billion of those deposits in, in mid-dated, long-dated sovereign debt that was yielding 1.8% interest. The Federal Reserve took the interest. By the way, would you, would you loan me money for 30 years at 3% interest rate? Like, can you imagine that? If the inflation rate was 8 or 10%, would you loan money out at 3% interest rate for the rest of your life? Not in a million years. Okay, that's what the banking executives in the U.S. did. At the, sing at the point when, when the You're talking about Silicon Valley Bank. All of them, right? P Signature, pretty much. all these guys. Not, ju not just the ones that went bankrupt, right? There's, th there's a host of banks. I, th I think they had, what was it, like $800 billion of unrealized losses or something. A host of banks went, and anybody that bought mid-dated or long-dated uh, bonds at the, you know, at the bottom of the market when interest rates were zero, they were loaning out money forever at 2% interest or 3% interest or 1.5% interest. And, um, and as soon as you redeem, what happened, of course, is the Fed raised interest rates from 25 basis points. Actually, the rates went from zero to 500 basis points in 12 months, about. That's the sharpest increase in interest rates in, in memory. That in itself is, I'm not going to say what it is. It's, you know, it's just horrific, terrifying to think that any public servant would do that. But... It's equally terrifying to think that it, if I was your money manager and if you had given me all your money when interest rates were zero and I, and I said, well, I guess interest rates will stay zero for the next 30 years. And so I'm going to loan it out as a bond and lock in a price of 2%. You know, you would have thought I was crazy. No, there is no individual, no, no corporation, no rational corporation, no economic actor that would loan money forever for 3% interest when inflation is running double or triple that. So the who question is, that? who would? And the answer is a bureaucrat, uh, uh, either a governmental bureaucrat, someone that is coerced by regulatory policy where they're forced to. For example, a bank can't buy Bitcoin, but a bank is almost obligated to buy treasuries. Right, so the politicians create a, a set of rules that strongly encourage you to do certain things and strongly discourage you to do other things. And generally, they encourage you to do the thing which is probably least economically viable. Yeah, so let me just answer two questions. What do I think will happen in the banking system and what do I think a person should do? What I think happens in the banking system is all of the regional banks, you know, the small, mid-sized banks are at a massive disadvantage right now because the government is, is showing that they're not going to bail out those, those equity holders. So there's a, there's a migration of deposits from the small banks to the big banks. You know, I think that, you know, the JP Morgans, the Bank of America, the, the mega banks will continue. They'll be just fine. They'll be supported by the government. The small banks are going to struggle, and that's what that's what you see going on right now. If you're a depositor, I mean, you'll probably get bailed out by the government. If you're a bondholder in the bank or an equity holder of the bank, you won't get bailed out, right? And so there's a crisis for investors, uh, whereas uh, whereas everybody that's a depositor doesn't want to sit around and take the risk, right? I mean, who wants any anxiety? So I so I think that. To the extent that you rely on banks, clearly um, the world is waking up and the U.S. is waking up and they're thinking, I want to be with big banks. Uh, I, I wouldn't have my money in a bank anywhere outside the U.S. in a weak country, right? You, you, need, you need to be in a rich, strong country to, uh, with a rich, strong bank. With regard to what individuals should do, um, I, I think the, the logical answer is for expenses, if, if you have expenses in the next three months, you have your expenses in the local currency, which is the peso, the naira, the whatever, because it's legally obligated for you to pay in the local currency. For the next three years of expenses, or one to three years of expenses, 
you put your your wealth in the a strong the strongest world currency in the world that's the dollar right now but you make sure that you have that currency either self custodied or you have it in a bank that you trust that's hard <laughs> If you can't find a bank, if you were in Lebanon right now, can we trust you, bank? <laughs> if you were in Lebanon right yeah. now, you wouldn't put your money in any bank. You would actually put it on the Bitcoin blockchain. For for any amount of money you want to keep the rest of your life, if you if you want to give it to your kids, if you want to actually retire on it, anything that's investable asset, you would put it in Bitcoin. You wouldn't put you would put it in a in the strongest possible world currency, the global the global money. And that's Bitcoin. You're not going to get rich investing in dollars. Do and you'll lose all your money if your dollars are in a weak bank. And if your dollars in a strong bank, you'll just get poor slowly. And you're going to get poor. <laughs> you're going to get poor rapidly if your money is in not the dollar but a weaker currency. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get completely bankrupt if you trust a weak bank. And so MicroStrategy, by the way, has we had like 90 million dollars. We had four plus billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. So go figure, right? 98% of our assets are actually in the strong money. 2% is in the world's strongest currency in, the, in a good bank, in, a, in one of the big four banks, right? And, uh, and that's about as much exposure as I want to a currency. You know, you need this near-death experience, this mortality event, before you will open your mind to embrace a new idea. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and if you live in Argentina, when you talk to Argentines, they say, my family has been completely bankrupted uh, twice in the past 30 years. Okay, so in, a, in South America, if you live in Venezuela, well, they've all been bankrupted twice in 10 to 15 years. Um, if you live in Brazil right now, I think the interest rates getting approached to four, approaching 14%, right? Money is hard to come by. And if you live in Africa, the Africans live under the CFA, uh, colonial franc, where they lose half their money every time they change currencies, and it's not convertible. And um, if you lived in, in uh, Nigeria, you know, you just ha you wake up one day and the bank says, you're only allowed to have $42 a day and if you live in if you live in India, that you know you wake up one day, this press release that says uh, all all rupee notes of ten thousand rupees or whatever above are now illegal, and you have to turn them all in in the next forty eight hours, or else they're null and void. And someone just invalidates the currency. If you lived in Russia in nineteen ninety eight, all the banks failed, and the ruble went to zero, and everybody lost everything. So I think that, uh, that people that live in other jurisdictions, if they've ever been completely bankrupt or seen their, their, their economy completely collapse, Sri Lanka, another good example. When that happens, then when someone says, okay, well, here's a bank in cyberspace and an asset that no one can meddle with and no one can, can corrupt or tamper with, you think, well, tell me more about that. But if you're, um, if you're a wealthy American, if you're Warren Buffett, you know, we, we have a very famous example, uh, a video that's going viral on Twitter. 13-year-old girl says to Warren Buffett, I'm really worried about the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world. We're printing lots and lots of dollars, and if we're not the reserve currency, the value of the dollar is going to collapse. We're going to have hyperinflation. What should I do, Mr. Buffett? You know, and I, I wouldn't normally criticize you know, a, a, a respected, successful business person of his age. But he and Charlie Munger did choose to go up on stage and answer questions and give financial guidance and advice and investment advice, and they are looked up to. And so you watch Warren Buffett answer the question, and his answer is, well, yeah, I mean, I guess the Fed inflated the, the money, but they needed to. And, uh, you know, it's really difficult, you know, and politics have a difficult mm. problem. And yeah, you're right, it is a problem. And Munger will say, you know, the dollar's going to zero. It's going to zero. They know it's a problem. And then he kind of meanders through it with, a, with a, a, an end advice, which is, well, you know, I don't know, but you know, America's a great country. Don't bet against America. 
But the, but the, but the, the blood-curdling, terrifying, you know, depressing you know, takeaway from the clip is, is the 13-year-old girl knows what the problem is. The country's full of people that can articulate the problem and write thousand-page books on the problem. If you're rich in America, you don't have the answer because you're too comfortable. Right? And so what you've got is a bunch of, of mega billionaires that are very successful in America, but they don't have an answer or solution to the 13-year-old girl. The solution to that question was Bitcoin, right? And Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger can't allow themselves to understand that because, because they're so successful, they don't need to open their mind to, and embrace a new idea. If Warren Buffett woke up tomorrow and his bank seized all of his assets and they were devalued to zero and he was a pauper and his neighbor the uber driver was walking around with a hundred thousand dollars worth of bitcoin on a hardware wallet warren would say what is that again mm -hmm. explain that to me yeah what do you mean my government my bank can't steal all my money that's a pretty good idea Right? And, and so I, I think that when you're a refugee from fleeing Iraq or you're crossing the border and, you know, and when you try to go through an airport and a hostile regime steals all your money and seizes all your gold, when you have to flee your 1,000 acre or 10,000 acre farm in Africa because a hostile regime decided it was illegal for people like you to own land, when that happens, you become a believer in... Uh, a, a non-sovereign store of value crypto asset network, which is what Bitcoin is. The people that came to this country, the Huguenots, you know, the, the settlers, the, the colonists, I think they understood it. I mean, they had all their, all their property seized from them from wherever they came from. And their idea was, here's a place where I can own something and people might not steal it from me. As soon as they got here, people started trying to steal it from them again. Right? That's the human condition. Just slower. Just slower. <laughs> but that's why they kept going west. It's like, I got to go west where there's no politicians to steal it from me. Right? And, that, and that's a pretty powerful driver. So I think that the, that the conclusion is people that are comfortable, they're fat, dumb, and happy in the United States are going to continue to reject new ideas like crypto assets like Bitcoin, because they don't have to. If, if I don't have to embrace a new idea, when I get to a certain age, I won't. And that, that, is, that is as old as the, it's the, the Thomas Kuhn structure of scientific revolution. He said, paradigm shifts only get embraced in times of war or when the old guard dies. If you want to introduce a new idea, you need a war. Wars kind of work because if we're fighting a war and I introduce an airplane and I drop a, a nuclear bomb on your head, then you stop rejecting air power and you stop rejecting atomic weapons. You, you embrace the reality that, yeah, they do work and maybe you need to figure it out. Wars work, but absent a war, people just have to, you know, they just have to pass on because they're not going to embrace a new idea. If you, if you don't spend, for, first you have to have an open mind and say, is it possible that this works? And then second, you have to spend somewhere around 10 hours to understand it. I just don't think he has an open mind and I don't think he spent 10 hours, right? I mean, it, it's, not, it's not uncommon, right? People in their 80s and their 90s don't generally embrace the wonder that is the Unreal Engine or TikTok yeah. or, their, or, or Alibaba. Their 90s. Right? So, so it's, I, I wouldn't, again, it, if they were private citizens, I don't, I don't criticize private 80 and 90 year olds, octogenarians and, and the like, uh, for not embracing the new cool thing, right? It, they don't have <laughs> to like, obvious, right? you don't have to like drone races, you know? It, you know, my, my father doesn't have to like drone races in his 80s. That's fine. Uh, but the point is, 
If you're going to tell people how to invest hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars, and you're going to give advice to a 13-year-old about how she can not be poor or not, or, or not starve to death, I, I think that then you have to actually study these things. And the elephant in the room is everybody in the world is facing inflation. Everyone in the world is facing counterparty risk. Everyone, everywhere in the world, we're losing faith in governments, banks, and currencies. The solution is a bank that isn't run by people, that isn't subject to the whim of a government, that is incorruptible, that allows you to be your own bank, right? And, and that is a message that's getting out. Uh, we just need to keep beating the drum on that. Uh, it, it is, I think, the most important economic opportunity slash issue slash technology of our time. I, I'm quite aware that that my impact is at the microstrategy level. I get to decide, you know, whether we're going to pay off a $205 million loan or not, right? I get to decide whether we're going to issue a billion dollars of equity or not. And I get, you know, so I have an impact over what MicroStrategy is doing as the chairman of MicroStrategy, and I have a responsibility to my employees, my shareholders, and the like. So a lot of my work is there. And then I have the ability to have an impact and a need to, to be engaged in the crypto economy. Hmm. So I'm spending a lot of time on Bitcoin, Bitcoin education, Lightning, development of, of Bitcoin applications on the Lightning network, those sort of things, right? That's where I can have an impact. In the macro economy, I study it because I want to know what's going on with China and Russia and interest rates and hyperinflation in Argentina. But I, I don't... You know, I, I have uh, no belief that I'm going to be able to control that, right? Like, uh, I don't pretend to be able to direct Argentine macroeconomic policy. And with regard to politics in general, you got to pay attention to what's going on with, you know, the Tucker Carlson's of the world, and you got to pay attention to the presidential race and, and the politics, the Senate and Congress, and the regulatory activities. But it's above my pay grade, right? If you look at my Twitter profile, I have laser eyes. And the, and the significance of laser eyes is if you want to make progress in this world, you have to focus and channel all of the energy you have behind a very, very particular objective. And I have one laser-like focus, right? Bitcoin is good money, right? Bitcoin is good for the world. Bitcoin is, is, a, a, is a global freedom, global property rights, Interesting. right? Like, I have a hundred other opinions, mm -hmm. but if, if I actually filled my feed with here's what I think about bicycles and here's what I think about diets and here's what I think about health and here's what I think about, you know, labor policy and here's what I think about states' rights and here's what I think yeah. about this country. At some point, uh, you just dilute your focus and you just, you don't have that much energy in this life. Ninety-two percent of the people are dying of natural causes. Ninety-five percent of the bandwidth, it, it bleeds at least. Ninety-five percent of the bandwidth is the most colorful way to die, right? It's the, not the most likely way to die. It's the most colorful way to die. And so I, I think that all, all media is distorted and they're, they're all edited and they're all focused to a certain agenda. The only thing you can reasonably do is you can scan a bunch of them. You can scan, you know, your own Twitter feed will also be distorted. So you have to scan other feeds. And then you have to be continually going through this exercise in your head of saying, that happened, is it true? And then how significant is it? For, for example, Argentine inflation, 105%, is it true? No because the actual inflation rate is higher, it's, it's indicative of a truth. How significant is it? Well, how many people live in Argentina? That's one level of significance. The second is how much money's in Argentina. And the third level of significance is how, you know, how symbolic or, or how, how indicative or catalytic is it to other activity that will happen in the rest of the world, right? How symbolic is it?
When you get to your 50s, if you read the same, like you read the same history book and you're reading it in your 50s, like, wow, I totally interpreted this differently when I was a ninth grader, right? When I was in college, I interpreted this differently. So you have to have real world experience. Oftentimes, you'll read a story and they'll state something and the truth is the exact opposite of what the story is. But you have to have lived life. Like for example, you read a headline, uh, we found 500 stone axes in a cave in Africa. They're between 1.2 and 1.7 million years old. Well, a school kid will say, oh yeah, so I guess they found some stone axes. I look at that and I say, well, there was a factory that made stone axes in Africa 1.7 million years ago. That meant that there was demand for thousands of stone axes a year. That meant that there was an entire civilization that existed, right? In fact, there was money, there was a government, <laughs> there was a furniture factory, there was a clothing factory, there was, a, there was agriculture, there was an entire society. You had to have 10,000 people all working together in coordination to justify having an inventory of 500 stone axes, right? And the only reason you actually read about the stone axes is stone axes is the only thing that's going to last a million years from now, right? And so what was there was a thousand x more interesting. The fact is there was an interesting higher level civilization with agriculture one and a half million years ago. They're not writing that in the history book because the literal historian only wants to report the bare minimum. But the reason that I could actually tell you a thousand other things is that I actually read books on Austrian economics. I, you know, I, I ran a business, I traded. I saw the, the, the meltdown and, and the, uh, the creation of dozens of, of industries, and I understand human nature, right? And so if you understand, you know, and you live the life, you're like, well, if I, you know, if I drink cartons of orange juice every day for months in a row, I know what's going to happen to me. It's not good. You can reverse that, right? And you can figure out what people ate 100,000 years ago. You know, you, they, they didn't do the things that we don't really think are good ideas today because they wouldn't have procreated through 100,000 generations. The, the time when you are most confident, when you have the most amount of formal education and the least amount of real world experience, like in your early 20s, right? Because you think you can do it better than everybody else and you haven't failed. And when you get another 25 years out, you're like, oh, I tried that, that didn't work. I tried that, that didn't work. I tried that, that didn't work. Oh yeah, that was a really good employee, but they quit because I was rude to them. Oops, I wish I hadn't done that. Oops, took that for granted. Bitcoin's never been hacked. So the, the, the only people that suffer with Bitcoin are people that trust their Bitcoin to the Sam Bankman Freeds of the world. If you put your Bitcoin in Celsius or BlockFi or FTX, if you, if you put it in, an, in a wildcat bank and the bank steals your money, right? It's, the, the real message of Bitcoiners is don't trust verify and be your own bank and not your keys, not your coin. So the message of Bitcoin is you can't trust anybody. If I, if, if I actually told you the world is made up of imperfect people and there, let's say there's a hundred families and we all have money and none of us trust each other and we all know we have idiot kids that are going to take over the family business and time and we want to create a community bank where we can collectively put our money, the answer would be, well, you don't put anybody in charge of it. You don't put any one family in charge of it. If, uh, you know, you might be the smartest amongst us and, you're, and your son's going to have an idiot me, son no. and eventually three generations down the road, it's not going to work anymore. So you write a piece of software. Everybody checks the software. We all agree the software is honest. We put the software on a computer. Nobody trusts your computer. We create a hundred computers. Everybody runs their own computer with the software. We all agree collectively not to change the software. And anybody that tries to change the software gets kicked out of the network. Mm. That's what Bitcoin is. It's, 
It's an honest approach to solve a problem when you can't rely on a person, you can't rely on a family, you can't rely on an institution, you can't rely on a government. What we rely on is the collective self-interest of rational people over time with regard to that one thing. And it, and it really is a beautiful invention. I would say that any rational person that studied Bitcoin for 10 hours knows that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. And so you, you know there's less than that because some millions of Bitcoin have been lost and they'll never be spent. And so you're buying Bitcoin because you know it's capped and you know that gold and silver and oil and soybeans and paper currency and land and apartments are not capped. Everything else on earth is going to keep increasing in supply forever. Bitcoin is not. So once you figure that out, then the only question is, is there anything better? And you sift through the other 20,000 cryptos, and if they're not better and they're not better, then this is the one. Now, every intelligent person with money has put their money on Bitcoin. So what are you going to bet on? You're going to bet on the networks that were invested in by people without money that aren't intelligent, right? So, so Bitcoin is the winner because the smart money has chosen it there are a lot of other catalysts, right? Every time there's hyperinflation in a place like Argentina, it's a catalyst. Every time a bank fails, it's a catalyst. Every time someone builds an application that's cool on Bitcoin, right? Like all the ordinals and inscriptions and whatever, they're driving up transaction fees, it's a catalyst. Every time a company like MicroStrategy buys another $100 million worth of Bitcoin, it's a catalyst. Every time a regulator actually clarifies the fact that Bitcoin is a commodity, an asset without an issuer, and it's special, that's a catalyst. So lots of catalysts, they're all going to continue. The result will be Bitcoin will chop its way up with volatility forever. Just going to keep grinding up. Because for you to believe Bitcoin's going to grind up, all you got to believe is that human beings have a natural tendency to want to f uh, to improve their life and protect their property and and uh, and uh, benefit their friends and family so sailor is pro freedom and pro markets and sailor believe he's an austrian economist so all value is subjective so here's what i think I think everybody should be able to launch whatever business they want to launch. And I think uh, everybody should be able to pursue, pursue uh, their happiness however they want. And I think that lots of people will create lots of things that won't work. So I'm not going to give you a recommendation of stocks because some businesses will work, some won't, and some stocks will, you will buy too high and some you will not. And I don't want to be on the hook for 10,000 stocks. I'm not going to tell you how to gamble, but I'm not going to tell you not to. I'm not going to give you a recommendation for a private business. You want to collect art? I, you know, I'm not going to tell you not to. I'm just not going to tell you which piece of art to buy to make money. I don't know which, uh, which thing is going to work. And I know that over time, all, all fiat currencies will fail. And over time, I believe most businesses in fact, all businesses will not be as good as investing in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the low risk asset. I do think that uh, what happened uh, over the past uh, five months is pretty interesting. If you go to New Year's Eve, um, the average fee on the Bitcoin blockchain was like three sats per V byte. I mean, there were blocks every 10 minutes that had $600 of transaction fees in them. Right. And so the miners were getting a reward of one hundred thousand dollars with six hundred dollars or three hundred dollars of fees. So the fees were one percent of the reward. Yeah. There were nothing de minimis. <clears throat> and, and what happened over five months is Bitcoin had a massive rally. All of a sudden, the miners were getting one hundred and fifty thousand dollar or two hundred thousand dollar reward. But then we saw fees, transaction fees that got to more than six Bitcoin, which was $180,000 in fees. So we went from $1,000 in fees to $100,000 in fees, a factor of 100 increase. And uh, the fees started to approach parity with the reward. If you're a, uh, an investor in Bitcoin mining, if you're a Bitcoin miner and you want a bullish thesis, 
In order to have a bullish thesis, you want to see that fees, transaction fees, are at parity with the rewards. And you want to, then you want to, to have a, a belief that transaction fees will increase at a rate faster than the hash rate. So if the hash rate's going up 20% a year and transaction fees are going up 30% a year, then that's a good business, a really good business. And, and so in a world where transaction fees are 1%, they, they're irrelevant, you don't have parity, and then the growth rate doesn't matter, and then all you see is the rewards are decreasing 18% a year, and that's a bearish scenario. Uh, so I think that what happened with ordinals and NFTs is we crossed this chasm from what was a bearish scenario to a bullish scenario. If I was a miner, I would be ecstatic. You know, if you, had, if you wanted to move $10 million of oil from New York to London, it would cost you about $350,000. So what if I want to move $10 million of Bitcoin from New York to London? What if I want to move $10 million worth of a document of something of... If you wanted to sell a $10 million work of art, that's $500,000 to a million or more in auction fees. Mm -hmm. so, so people have thought, well, transactions, man, they, they, there's no future for them. But I actually am of the opinion that transactions at a dollar or two dollars transaction, they're very undervalued. This is the most valuable, most tamper-proof, immutable, secure transaction network in the world. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars and I said attack the network, you couldn't do it. If you were a nation with a hundred billion dollars and four years, you could slow it down, but you couldn't stop it. So I, I think that the real significance of ordinals and NFTs and inscriptions is people used to take the transactions for, for granted and they undervalued the Bitcoin mining network. And now I think what you have is a lot of speculation and you also have, um, you have a migration of crypto development energy from the other cryptos to Bitcoin. That's a good thing, I think. It's, in very, it's, it's inevitable because Bitcoin is the low risk crypto network and the high security crypto network. So, so you're going to see speculation move, you're going to see development move. But, um, but long term, what's really significant here is that people are going to see Bitcoin as the most secure cyber network or the most secure computer network in the world. And if I told you I'm going to burn a document and I want it to stay immutable for a hundred years and I don't want any hostile corporation or nation state or actor to be able to tamper with it or stop it. And in a hundred years, I want to prove that that's my document. You know, Satoshi could sign a digital document. He could sign a message today and prove that he owns $30 billion of Bitcoin and he could do it in a split second. That's the power of the Bitcoin network. And that has been under-realized. It's, uh, it's underestimated. So I think that what, what's gonna go right now is it's gonna be a lot of excitement, but ultimately the ethically sound, technically sound, economically sound future is for people to realize that Bitcoin is this immutable, you know, incorruptible, non-sovereign, computer network and it's going to protect your money but it's also going to protect your integrity and people are going to pay money for truth on that network and that's what's going to finance those miners and when you look at all those miners running in texas you're saying what are they doing they're protecting the integrity of western civilization maybe of all they're protecting the integrity of the human race for the next thousand years I think that the number one criteria uh, to run an organization, you know, is humility combined with a bit of wisdom uh, from life experience, but combined with an extraordinary amount of, of energy. You, you know, you, you have to eat, sleep, and breathe the thing. <clears throat> and I think that organizations that have um, that have people with too much confidence, they tend to go off the rails. And so it's, it's good to know what you don't know.
another big part of what's going on right now is the other side of this, which is investors in the mainstream are going to are going to understand uh, based upon results why a digital commodity is a better idea than a digital security. And that's happening in front of our face. 98% of the stuff in the crypto ecosystem is going to shake out. There's going to be a few strong players that will go through the registration process and they will grow up to be a registered, full dis fully disclosed uh, currency, like a circle or a tether will have to become registered and regulated. Uh, there may be a few digital securities. There'll be a massive fight over what that means and, and what you can do with it. The digital exchanges, both the crypto exchanges and the DeFi exchanges will have to register and, um, and this entire Wild West environment will, uh, will start to dissipate. It'll be, a, it'll be like the meteorite that hit the earth, you know, 80 million years ago and a lot of stuff will get wiped out. Um, a few things will rise through the uh, rise out of the crypto ecosystem that'll be cleaned up, and then a lot more mainstream actors uh, will enter the space. Mainstream investors, mainstream banks, mainstream financial providers, uh, registered companies, and uh, the entire industry will take on a new character. Today. We struggle with the challenge of authority. You know, Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And um, the only difference between absolute power today and absolute power 10,000 years ago is today we have a company that listens to everything a billion people say. We have another company that answers the questions that four billion people ask. We have companies that deliver the food and all of the goods that you need to survive to hundreds of millions of people. We have uh, one company that delivers all of the business software to 80 million corporations, indirectly serving billions and billions of employees. Now, I ask you the question, if you got ejected out of the third biggest country in the world, or if I denied you privileges to live in any of the five largest countries in the world, would your life go on? Probably. Now, what if you actually got canceled by Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google? Tomorrow. The question is, would your life go on? What? Stop and think a little bit about what happens if they simply turned off your account seized your photos, turned off your messages, took your documents. What if Microsoft just denied you access privileges? Could you run a business? Could you work? It's a big question. Human nature doesn't change. Uh, that struggle existed 100,000 years ago, that struggle exists today. What does change is technology. 100,000 years ago, an enraged human being could maybe kill 10 other people. And today, an enraged human being can kill 100 million people. And so as technology advances, our thoughts about, about ethics and morality and technology and civility have to evolve. So the question really is, what happens if this goes on? Companies get bigger, we got big tech, governments get bigger. As the companies get bigger, when the company serves three billion people, then that means one bureaucrat can make one phone call to that company and potentially turn off all of the information flowing to all three billion people over the weekend, right? This is a... It's a new idea, and it's a, it's a disturbing idea. You know, if another famous writer, Robert Heinlein, he had a quote, quote, he said, you don't win wars by dying for your country, 
You win wars by making the other guy die for his country. We don't want to be martyrs. We want to be winners. And that is the challenge we face today. There's, there's no point in going on strike unless you've formed the union first. Just going on strike without the organization in advance is uh, just self-inflicted martyrdom. Bitcoin is a union. I'm gonna leave the thought and continue with, uh, with my speech. We'll come back to it at the end. There's a freedom saga in the history of the human race. What is that saga? Somebody grows up, they struggle against the collective. Life is oppressive. They can't farm, they can't live, they can't worship, they can't celebrate, they can't breathe. So what do they do? Well, they go over the horizon, beyond this horizon. We travel somewhere over the hill. After that, we go to the new world. We get in a ship, you're a Huguenot, if you're a Protestant in Catholic land, if you're a Catholic in Protestant land, if you're a second son, at some point you're a Quaker, um, you get in a ship, you go to the New World. What happens after you settle the New World? Well, it gets too oppressive on the East Coast. Go west, young man, and we go west. We wanna get away from too many politicians, too much government, too many well-intentioned individuals trying to help us with more laws, more government services. Well, in the 20th century, Peter and I are both aeronautical engineers. We read every science fiction writer and, and, and the great romantic science fiction tomes from Heinlein, et cetera, were all about Earth is too crowded. We gotta get off this planet. We gotta go to space. Elon Musk channels this aspiration every day. But in general, we all grew up thinking that in the 70s and the 80s, go to space. Now the problem is, it turns out to be fairly expensive to go to space. We didn't quite make it. We, didn't, we figured out how to send millions of people to the new world and we spent millions of people west, but we couldn't send millions of people to the moon or Mars or the next habitable G-type star. So where is the next frontier for those thirsting for freedom? cyberspace and here i pause and i ask you to like steve jobs said think different thinking conventionally will get you killed we will be martyrs we will not be winners right if you want to die for your country or die for your cause you can uh, you can uh, do that by thinking conventionally if you want to win you need to think unconventionally we have to embrace new paradigms. The idea of crypto, or the great achievement of Satoshi Nakamoto, is the concept of creating a truly decentralized network, giving it to billions of people, allowing people to, to uh, de in a decentralized way, protect that network, support that network, serve that network, benefit from that network, transcending the constraints of a CEO, a corporation, a country, a city, a company. Bitcoin is a shining city in cyberspace, and you can go there once you understand it. Bitcoin and objectivism, they have a common cause. Ayn Rand in 1959 said, I'm for the separation of, of the state and economics, just as we had the separation of church and state. Whereas uh, Hayek in 1984 said, I don't believe we, we shall ever have good money again before we take the thing out of the hands of the government. That is, we can't take it violently out of the hands of government, all we can do is by some sly roundabout way introduce something that they can't stop. Clearly both, both movements are thinking about separating economics from the state and from the collective. 
The difference is for thousands and thousands of years, the technology for doing that was imperfect. The technology of gold to separate the power from the state doesn't work when they just shoot you and take your gold. The technology of cows or tobacco or fiat currency or buildings, they don't work that well to separate economics from the state. So although this was an ideal and aspiration that we never had the technology to realize it. January 3rd, 2009 is the singularity. That's the point at which Satoshi Nakamoto developed the technology to transfer value through space without a trusted third party. Most people don't realize this, but Satoshi opened a portal from the physical realm into the digital realm, and energy began to flow into cyberspace, bringing life to a formerly dead realm consisting only of shadows and ghosts, bringing conservation of energy and matter, objectivity, truth, time, and consequence into the digital realm, delivering property rights, freedom, and sovereignty that is separate from the physical and the political realm to humanity. Most of the world, myself included, ignored this chain reaction for the next decade. It happened, it flickered, it burned, we ignored it, except for the OG Bitcoin cipher punks, and they can tell you that everybody thought they were crazy. In March of 2020, the world came to a grinding halt. Suddenly, billions of people woke up to the prospect of an economic collapse, losing faith in their institutions and their governments. On August 10th, MicroStrategy, struggling with this existential crisis, adopts the Bitcoin standard. At that point, I concluded the road to serfdom is working exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. And we saw an escape from economic slavery in the form of what we thought was digital gold. But as I've explained, it, it turned out to be much more than digital gold. On September 18th, after fully adopting the Bitcoin standard and after talking to some more Bitcoiners, I had this epiphany. I went to Twitter and I posted the following. Bitcoin is a swarm of cyber hornets serving the goddess of wisdom, feeding on the fire of truth, exponentially growing ever, smarter, faster, and stronger behind a wall of encrypted energy. And I think Ayn Rand would understand what I was saying. What it means is for the first time in the human race, we have unleashed a freedom virus, a truth virus, Bitcoin is something special. Galt's Gold, uh, Gulch is the Bitcoin network. Rather than removing your labor from a corrupt economy, you should remove your money from a corrupt economy. Bitcoin's a protocol to create free ideas, free economies, and free assets beyond the control of corrupt institutions. It's a fast, fair, and equitable method to settle the differences of 8 billion people. We say in the Bitcoin world, fix the money, fix the world. Success requires courage, clarity, and commitment. Look, there's 20,000 cryptos. There's one that's 95% dominant, which is ethically sound, technically sound, economically sound. Bitcoin is reared in metal. It's the hardest substance in the universe. Most people don't know it. Most people are afraid of it. Never done that before. When we bought Bitcoin, we bought 250 million. No, one, no public company had ever bought any. People thought we were crazy. So then we bought another 175 million. People thought we were crazy. Then we bought 600 million more. 
People said, you can't stand on it, it'll destroy you. It's like standing on a bridge made of steel. And I concluded, it's the perfect engineered material to solve our problem, but people are living in fear. And how are we going to get them to not be fearful? And I, re I was reminded of Andrew Carnegie's example. It's like, build the bridge, go stand out in the middle of the bridge. You build an airplane, fly the airplane. Show people that it's not going to break. That's what MicroStrategy did. We said, well, if it's good for 100 million, it's good for a billion. If it's good for a billion, we might as well go for 4 billion. Right? And at some point, people will realize that they have more to fear by not embracing this technology than by embracing it. Right now, it's a $400 billion asset. There are $400 trillion of other assets floating around in our current fiat system. They're leaking energy. They're corrupt. They're inefficient. They're controlled by the collective. Bitcoin is 0.1% of the human race's liquid energy. 99.9% .9 of the world doesn't get it. They're not there. That 99.9% .9 haven't moved to Galt's Gulch. That means you're still early. So plug in your, you can plug in yourself, your company, your organization, your agency, your product, your service, your family, or your ideology. I said to you at the beginning of the talk, Bitcoin's a union. The union gets more powerful as more people join. And in the war for the future of money, it's going to be won with money. As the money moves into the network, the, the monetary union gets more powerful. Everybody that joins the network has that much more power. And your only hope against the oppressive force of the collective is to unionize. Your own, your own activities and organize your activities with people of like ideology that believe as you believe. More money, more people, more power. Bitcoin is an economic machine based on a truth machine poised to emerge as a freedom machine. It's the best choice we have to save our civilization and realize the ideal world envisioned by Ayn Rand and the objectivist movement. Join us. Um, look, if you're going to invest in Bitcoin, a short time horizon is four years, a mid time horizon is 10 years. The right time horizon is forever. You know, Warren Buffett said, you know, if you wouldn't hold it for 10 years, you shouldn't hold it for 10 minutes. So if you look at the course of four years, no one's ever lost money over four years holding Bitcoin. And, and if you look at, you know, uh, our experience, we started buying it at $10,000 and now it's up by a factor of four. So, so given the right time horizon, you're fine. So it's a blessing and a curse. The blessing is it makes it the most exciting, interesting thing in the financial universe everywhere in the world. And, and the curse is it can induce anxiety for people that have a short attention span or, or are focused on a narrow time horizon. You want to make a lot of money? There's two ways to make a lot of money. One way is you take something you have huge conviction on and you leverage it. Like I'm levered long Bitcoin, right? I had 250 million capital. I currently have six and a 6.2 billion position. Okay. My bet is $6.2 billion. How did I get from 250 million to 6.2 billion? That's like laser like focus, you know, like all the Bitcoiners, we got laser eyes. The point of laser eyes is Focus on how you can get more Bitcoin, okay? There's another way. You can go and buy another coin that might go up by a factor of 100 without leverage. But, you know, then you're trying to pick which of 100, you know, or, or you could pick a stock. So now you're, now you're trading, you know. Google was a good play over the last 12 months. It's up 80%. Amazon looks like it would have been good. It's been a disaster. Okay, so who would have guessed that Google was going to destroy Amazon 12 months ago? And that's, it's, and well, they keep doing it quarter after quarter. So um, that's a different thing. 
it's not it's not for us right i mean i'm more interested in how do you borrow a billion dollars for zero percent interest <laughs> Look, I think Bitcoin is by far the highest upside, lowest risk, clearest choice, most compelling trade of the decade by far. Everything else would be diluted. If I was Facebook and I wanted to clean up cyberspace and I agreed uh, to let someone post 100,000 Satoshis, in a lightning wallet in order to get um, in order to get verified by Facebook and um, and then that that allowed people on Facebook to know that I was going to be civil and safe in my behavior they might very well get a billion people to plug lightning wallets into Facebook and deliver civility and safety in cyberspace for a billion people and they would get rid of all the scammers, imposters, trolls, and eliminate hostility toward children and women and, uh, and shut down a whole set of scammy schemes that go on in the platform. So you can make your product better using, uh, using something like Bitcoin and Lightning, right? I mean, Twitter just allowed uh, you to tip using Lightning. That's a good thing. The ability for anybody on the planet to send $10 to anybody else on the planet, that's a, that's a product improvement. The Chivo wallet in El Salvador allowed 3 million people in El Salvador to set up a bank account in three weeks and get money for, you know, with no remittance fee from anywhere in the world instantly at the speed of light. They were paying hundreds of millions of dollars a year in Western Union fees and wire transfer fees. So, so if you're using Bitcoin and Lightning in your product, you're probably making the product better. If you're just offering to sell your beach house for Bitcoin, you know, all you're doing is marketing. Uh, I mean, nobody in their right mind would want to trade an asset going up 140% a year, you know, for a liability. You know, like, you, like if you bought a Lambo with Bitcoin, you could have been like a billionaire eight years later. So probably not a good idea to try. I wouldn't trade my Bitcoin for any asset, right? Name one other asset that's gone up 140% a year for a decade. And the answer is none. There's nothing. There is no stronger asset. There's no stronger trade. There's nothing. There's no higher quality property you could possibly own than pure digital energy. Pure digital energy a pure digital property. It's better than the best stock. It's better than the best land. It's better than the best building. It's better than the best anything, really. And uh, so a better idea instead of selling it would be um, pledge it as collateral for a loan. I have a million dollars of Bitcoin. I borrow $100,000 at, at LIBOR plus 100 basis points or LIBOR plus 500 basis points, I pay 5% interest, I buy the Lamborghini, and then the Bitcoin doubles and doubles and doubles, and in about eight years, I have a billion dollars, and I still have the Lamborghini. The only safe harbor for an institutional investor, if you wanted to invest in digital property, is Bitcoin. It's not that you can't invest in a security, but, you're, but the problem is if it is a security, there's all sorts of questions about can you trade it and when, and it's unethical for a politician or a public figure to endorse a security. But, so there's all sorts of problems with them because they're not registered securities. Let me say it this way. There's four types of buckets of money. There's the saving. If you want to save money and give it to your grandchildren, then you just convert a weak asset to a strong asset. And that means you sell currency and you sell stocks and you buy uh, digital property like Bitcoin or you buy like land you're going to give to your grandchildren. You know, you're buying hard, tangible something to hold 100 years, right? If you're an investor, you invest in a company or technology you think is going to be a screaming uh, win, and there's risk. It might have competitors, it might win, it might lose. The Air Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Apples, the Amazons, whatever. It's an investment. If you're a trader, 
you're trading risk derivatives and what direction is the yield curve going to go and you're trading pairs this will do that and you know you're about speed and leverage and if you if you know you're a good trader you know how to trade something you know it right if you if, if you don't know you're the best at doing that then you probably shouldn't do that but but people do it if you just if you're just focused you got to be focused and then the last is speculation and you know you got sometimes you want to speculate it's fun you go to a casino you gamble some money you gamble the money that you can't afford to lose there's some things that are speculative as a publicly traded company we, I, I have legal, ethical, civil liabilities, right, to my shareholders. I need to disclose what I'm doing. I need to register it, right? I'm a fiduciary for them. So we have a very straightforward strategy. It's like we're going to buy and hold Bitcoin. What you want to do is get rich slowly, not get rich quick. And that means that the time-tested technique for investment is you, is you buy high-quality, scarce, desirable property and you hold it forever. And uh, you just got to figure out what is scarce and desirable and high-quality. Um, I, th I think that um, Bitcoin is the only asset in this space that is that is broadly institutionally held. And it, and, and it is more than zero. For example, we bought $4 billion of it. So we know that companies have it. We know that institutional investors have it. We know there are insurance companies that hold it. So it's not zero, but it is, um, it is not nearly as broadly held as it will be. And I, I think that we're still early days. I think that uh, it's, uh, the institutional interest in Bitcoin has dramatically jumped in the macro community and the hedge fund community over the past year. I think uh, you can see in the, in the body language and the rhetoric of um, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, you know, Jamie Dimon and the way that uh, David Solomon speaks about us and the way that BlackRock speaks about it and the way that Ray Dalio speaks about it and the way that George Soros speaks about it you can see that um, we're no longer at the stage where people are skeptical that it will continue to exist or skeptical of its value. I think it's now, it's now got the grudging respect of a lot of people. We're really more at the stage where um, we're waiting for regulatory clarity. There's just a lot of, a lot of political debates you know, at, at the DC level. Uh, over over how much friction will uh, will be in the space, I think the banks would like to see more clarity from banking regulators about how much they can hold on their balance sheet and what the reserve ratio would be. And I think the accounting treatment clearly has been a has been a liability for large institutions because indefinite and intangible is is it's a uh, always going to understate the value and it's also going to create uh it's always going to create confusion because i could hold a billion and you could hold a hundred million and we would both look like we held a hundred million and you would have to dig deep into my financial statements to know the difference and so it just makes everything hard and opaque so so i think that uh that uh we have more adoption to come and uh and Every single, every single thing that happens, every time that there's an advance from the FDIC or FASB or CFTC or SEC or Congress, uh, I think all those things are, you know, are catalysts for adoption. And, uh, and we're gonna see more institutional adoption as time goes on. I, I think that Bitcoin is a million times better than gold and is going to gradually demonetize gold over time. So, no, gold will go to the utility value of gold, you know, whatever that utility value is. But uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's going to be adopted as money in the 21st century. I think Bitcoin is a better gold than gold. You can move it at the speed of light. You can see with the lightning network evolving that pretty soon we'll have a billion people able to, able to move any block of Bitcoin anywhere friction free. And so Bitcoin is uh, digital money for the 21st century. Gold was metallic money for the 19th century. 
So I just think if you believe in sound money, then you should do yourself a service and you ought to sell your gold and you ought to buy Bitcoin because Bitcoin is sound money for the 21st century and gold was sound money for the 19th century. Just that simple. The dollar is the strongest medium of exchange in the world, and so it is strengthening against other currencies, but the currencies are the, are the weakest store of value, the foreign currencies are weak store of asset, value assets. So, so foreign currencies are collapsing, South American currencies, African currency, Sri Lankan currency, you know, Middle Eastern, you know, well, Turkish currency, Lebanese currency, Russian, Ukrainian currencies. Russia, I guess, doing better because they're tied to commodities. But I think that, uh, that you've got a, ba a basket of strong currencies that be pegged to the dollar, and they're losing 15% of their value or more a year against scarce assets. And then you've got weak currencies that are losing 15% of their value against the dollar, right? If we look, uh, you know, South, uh, the South African Kruger Rand, the Korean won, the Great British Pound, the Euro, they're all down 11 to 13 percent. Polish is down 16 percent, the Yen's down 18 percent over the course of about a year. So they're collapsing against the dollar. And then the developing markets are collapsing 40 percent against the dollar. So uh, do I think it'll happen? Continue? Yeah. I actually think that in a digital world, 8 billion people want to hold a dollar, they don't want to hold a local currency. So if I could swap, like name a currency in South America you want to hold other than the dollar. There isn't one. So, uh, so the only thing that keeps people from swapping all their local currencies for dollars is um, whether they trust Tether, or whether they, whether they can get access to Tether or Circle, right? <laughs> right, because UST wasn't a trustworthy dollar, right? and maybe you can't get access. But I think that there's no doubt if you're looking at your bank freezing your assets and devaluing your assets in local currency, you know, you want to hold the U.S. dollar as your medium of exchange. And you want a simple world or a simple way to see the world. If you need your money in less than four years, you probably want to keep it in the dollar. And if you need your money in more than four years, if you want to hold it between four and 40 years, you put it in property and the best property in the world is Bitcoin and the best currency in the world is the dollar and there are weaker properties like an Airbnb or, or building or stock and they're weaker for, because they've got counterparty risk and they've got tax risk and execution risk and competitive risk. But, and maybe they're not so portable, you can't really move a ranch out of Zimbabwe to San Francisco when you have to flee the country. So what can you move out of Africa to San Francisco when you want to flee the country, right? Bitcoin, you can move. And the rest, unclear. So, uh, so I, I think that uh, the general macroeconomic trend, what, what can you say? You can say the economy doesn't work so well, right? The economy doesn't work so well. It stopped working well in February of 2020. And it's, I think uh, Lynn Alden tweeted a chart of uh, Japanese tourist arrivals, where the entire Japanese tourist industry went to zero in March of 2020, and is still at zero. So it's pretty obvious some things just don't work. The economy's not gonna work well. The money supply is increasing. The inflation reduction bill is, what is it? Six or $800 billion worth of spending. Everybody's gonna keep spending more money. Uh, uh, some currencies are gonna collapse completely. The government's gonna collapse with them. That'll happen in the developing world. That will result in capital controls. We see that, we saw it happen in Sri Lanka, you see in Nigeria and a lot of places, now it's, uh, it's illegal to accept dollars for payment. So you're gonna have capital controls, you're gonna have export controls, you're gonna have import controls, you're gonna have wage and price controls. That will impair the economic machine from functioning more. As that happens, you know, governments will print more money as they print more money, the value of the currency will fall against scarce desirable assets. You can't print more energy. And so that's why you can't print more food. So certain things will have tangible value. The best idea, the best idea in a world where, where it's very difficult to move cross borders and it's very difficult to manufacture things, 
and it's very difficult to buy and sell things, the best idea is digital energy, you see. <laughs> because once you, once you convert energy to a block of encrypted energy, and that's what Bitcoin is, you can hold it forever with no maintenance cost. And you can transport it anywhere in the world for no transaction fee. Everything else is more expensive. The average person can't hold 100 barrels of oil for a decade. You know, you can't warehouse oil, you can't warehouse soybeans. And if you operate a business, you might wake up and find out that your business is not allowed to export or import or manufacture or something. And so, so um, all those other parts of the economy, they struggle with these headwinds and you have to take them into account if you're an investor. Ha <laughs> ha!